Member, member, go on, you can go. Thank you. Morning, Chairperson, and morning to the guest. My name is Noemi Kondlo. I'm a member of the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning uh, to you and good morning to all my colleagues, members. Uh, my name is Khalil Barankais and I'm a member of the Finance Committee of the Western Cape Parliament. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to the Minister. Good morning to the colleagues and good morning to everyone in the House and online. My name is Mbulelo Isaac Sileku, member of the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. And while we're still online, um, if those online would also like to introduce themselves who haven't yet done so. Uh, good day, Chair and uh, colleague um, members. Um, the name is Bradley Augustine. Um, I'm dialing in from uh, Durban at the Transnet Port Terminal's uh, uh, head office. Um, assisting with the uh, presentation um, from TPT. Thank you. To, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's Mark Malo. I am representing TFR Rail in the Western Cape. Uh, I've dialed in from Belleville. All right, I'll move on to those in attendance in the house and I'll start with the minister. Good morning, Chair. My name is Mireille Wengen. I'm the provincial minister responsible for finance and for economic development and tourism. Good morning. My name is Jane Johnston. I am deputy director general at the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. Good morning, Chair. My name is Ilse van Skovek. I'm the Chief Director of DDAT, responsible for sector support. Town for the provincial government. Good morning, Chair. My name is Basil Hannibal. I represent the South African Freight Forwards Association and a member of the Port Consultative Committee. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Kwebi from the Southern African Association of Freight Forwarders, Western Cape Secretariat. Thank you. We'll start with you, Captain, and then we'll go right around the room. Okay, thanks and good morning, everyone. My name is Vernal Jones, um, the Acting Managing Executive in the Western Region for Transit and National Ports Authority. Um, and I'll also maybe just extend apologies that were formally sent through, uh, Chairperson. Um, for our Transnet board and our Transnet executives, but more so over to our acting chief executive to advocate Phyllis DeFeto. If I can just formally um, get that recorded, the apologies have been noted. Thanks. Morning, Chairperson, Minister, members and colleagues. My name is Rajesh Dana. I'm the port manager at the Port Cape Town. Good morning all, Oscar Borchitz, uh, Acting Managing Executives of um, Transit Port Terminals. Vernal has extended the apologies as well for Transnet Executives. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson. My name is Voice Wamangu. I am the PLO from Transnet. Warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much. Um, so that with that, in terms of apologies, we do note the apologies of some of the transnet officials as well as particularly advocate De Feto. We know that she works very well and she takes the committee very seriously. So um, we know that she's also ably represented today by yourself, Captain. Thank you. Um, with that, just a brief reminder on the rules of engagement. Um, so we will have an answer, uh, an opportunity for question and answers after each presentation. Noting that the members are online today, members, if you can use the raise hand function, I'll monitor that on my side when you do have questions, but please save your questions for then. Also, um, to those online, kindly keep yourselves muted and keep your videos off for the duration and less called upon to speak. With that, we'll now move on to our first presentation for today, or our first submission rather, and that would be from the Department of Economic Development and Tourism on addressing inefficiencies at the port of Cape Town. All right, we'll hand over. 
So thank you, Chair. I'll make a few opening remarks and then hand over to the team uh, who have prepared a presentation for the committee uh, for this morning. And we'll be presenting to you our analysis of the functioning of the Port of Cape Town, in particular the container terminal, which, as the committee is aware, um, had uh, issues over the peak ex export season at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, where we saw uh, productivity dropping substantially and, of course, affecting exports, um, which have the risk of adding costs and uh, potentially losing market share and reason why this matter is so important. Um, Trade is, of course, a concurrent competency between the national and provincial spheres of government. And so as a province and as the Western Cape government, uh, it's very important for us that the port works uh, optimally. Um, and as you may be aware, 55 percent of the country's primary agricultural exports are exported through the port of Cape Town, which makes this port essential uh, not only for the Western Cape, but for the whole of South Africa. Um, and if the port improves, it helps our economy to improve. And as I always say, if the port works, our economy works. So all our efforts and work are really aimed at uh, realizing the full potential of the port, uh, as well as the entire logistics value chain, so that we can generate economic growth and uh, create much needed jobs. Um, I think we're clear on the need for urgent action uh, in the immediate term. Um, at the Port of Cape Town, but also importantly are the vital investments and technologies that are needed in the longer term to make sure that we can enable future growth. Um, and so just uh, in conclusion, um, it is a priority for us because we believe that logistics, mobility and export facilitation are critical pieces of the puzzle of us being able to achieve breakout economic growth that gets us on a trajectory of prosperity and hope. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's my privilege to be in the room with you again and with the honourable members and with my colleagues and with people online. Chair, I have 11 slides to share with you and um, Ilza and Joanne and I discussed that perhaps we will focus on the challenges I think that Minister so eloquently managed uh, to, to articulate and the interventions we've been following for the past three, four years or so to deal with them. I'm trying to get my uh, presentation to move. For some reason, it's frozen. Let's just stop and share again. Chair what, uh, Chair, what we thought we would do is we'll touch on a bit of background and then we are going to articulate how we've discussed or how we've understood the challenges in the, part, in the past and how we've refined that understanding in different ways with action research, with engagement along the logistics chain. Um, and then we will want to, true to our economics department, give you a sense of how we measure the impact of uh, Port of Cape Town logistics, specifically the container cargo logistics. Just give us a moment. Sorry, Take Chair. We will get back to Teams, which will be there. Here we are. Thank you. For sharing again. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Unpack the 
economic impact as we've quantified it in terms of contribution to economic growth, in terms of job creation, and even contribution to the fiscus, becoming increasingly important in the view of last night's budget speech. And then um, getting closer to how the current situation is converging, Chair, with um, how we are finding each other, when I mean we, province and Transnet, its different operating divisions, the authority and the various actors in the logistics chain and how we are thinking of going forward from there. So the history has been bittersweet. Uh, National Treasury invited a global port expert by the name of Khali Bishel in 2022 to advise them on interventions to improve logistics in the country. Khalid developed a, a, a port efficiency index of the four main ports in South Africa, as well as what he considered to be their benchmark ports. So the, the ports that would typically compete with Cape Town and Durban in terms of parcel size and top type of cargo. And Chair, you'll be interested to see that in 2011, and some people in this room were still involved in the port, Cape Town was the best performing container terminal of all ports in that competitor class. Unfortunately, after 29, there was a bit of a, a, a decline. In fact, the decline became serious. And if we continue the work that Bisho did, he stopped in 2019. If we continue on perhaps a more simple analysis where we use ship working hours, we find a precipitous drop in 2023 to roughly half of what Transnet's own target is. We thank God and we thank everyone in the management team, including Oscar behind me and his and his um, uh, management team for what appears to be a bottoming out chair. For the past three weeks, I have noted that this decline has suspended and I'm even beginning to see the first signs of a recovery that we are most grateful for and that we are hoping could continue. Chair, when we started looking at this, um, Minister Wenger hosted a stakeholder dialogue last Tuesday, the first of which was in December 2019. We had almost everyone who's in the room, we had in the room that day and even more, and we collectively created what I might call the menu of what the problems were. And that at the top was institutional. So it was the idea that there's this complex mechanism of activities in a container terminal, even outside of it, each of it managed by its own organization structure, but no one pulling the whole complex set of activities together. So there was an institutional vacuum. And that is normally fine when all the wheels work in sync. But as soon as that clockwork is disrupted, and there's no management intervention to restore the equilibrium. That's when uh, things literally fall apart. And then associated with that would be communication problems because communications are not managed if there's no central institutional structure. We believe industrial relations was an issue. We, we feel sad in a way that the rich data that's available in every one of the nodes was never utilized to manage the entire logistics chain and some critical members in the logistics chain. And here I refer particularly to the cargo owners and Terry will speak more about that, the, specifically the exporters, but we don't want to leave importers out either. They felt they never had a voice that in the noise of the terminal and the shipping lines and everywhere else, the voice of the person owning this container of fruit or wine was drowned out and not heard. 
And then, Chair, we cannot get past the issue of the old and in inadequate fleet of heavy lifting equipment. So that's essentially your three, your ship to shore crane, your rubber tide gantry, and then the tractor and trailer running in between, carrying the containers between those cranes and gantries. And then the third reason um, that we picked up, Chair, is that the colleagues in Transnet, who we love very much, did not seem to have a growth strategy for Cape Town. Our impression was that we kept running with the numbers that we were moving as if that was the market and the target, whereas the market was pushing and needed to grow. But Cape Town's market is unique in the sense that it has these twin peaks, which is any production manager's nightmare. And then in the peak, I'll show you in a minute, we have the high wind speeds. So it's almost a double whammy to the production manager. How do you create capacity, not only to manage your average cargo flow, but to deal with those peaks when you get hit in the face with wind? And wind is not the only problem. There's fog and there's ranging as well. And all of that manifests in a really ugly bunching of trucks on Duncan Road and Marine Drive. And the more those truck drivers have to wait, the more anxious and frustrated they get, and the more that manifests in extremely unruly behavior. Chair, I'm just sharing this slide of the um, logistics chain very briefly with, with you, not to go into the detail, but to explain that every one of the nodes is a complex system in itself. The exporters, and Terry will go into much more detail, are not only fruit exporters, they export wine, they export all sorts of dry goods. Even the fruit exporters themselves are not homogenous. You have exporters of highly perishable plums and table, table grapes, and then you have exporters of slightly less perishable oranges and apples, and then you have exporters of things that don't mind waiting a day or two. But these first ones cannot wait. Every day they wait, it implies a quality penalty from the retailer in Europe on the exporter from South Africa. And this was the slide I had in mind when I said the problem that we were faced with in 2019 when cargo movement went pear-shaped is that there was no institutional structure to manage this cluster. Western Cape government stepped into the space and will remain in that space until the system is fluid again, until it manages itself, or until some alternative system is put in place, perhaps a form of a uh, project management unit or joint action team. At the national level, Chair, you'll be aware that the president has created a National Logistics Crisis Committee for exactly this purpose, to create, to pull the whole chain together, create a new set of direction that's calibrated with the volume of growth in the economy so that there's equilibrium between logistics and the economy, as the minister explained so clearly this morning. So, Chair, moving to our cargo, I thought you might be interested. This is a bit of a pre-look from the basis of what we know, how much cargo moves, from the basis of what we know, how many orchards were planted, from the basis of what we know, what the growth in each orchard is, and on the different other commodities than fruit. So on your x-axis, you have the months of the year for 2026. This is our projection of cargo growth per month. On the y-axis on the left, you have what we call TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units. That's the standard measure of a container. It's a smaller container. On the right axis, you have hours, which relates to the dotted line, showing you how much wind has manifested in the last 10 years in that month. And you'll see the massive um, intensity of wind in the first three months when we have the very high volumes of perishable cargo. 
yellow shows you table grapes and blue shows you oranges. So the bottom of the half gives you fruit. The top of the half gives you all the other cargo. And I'll be grateful if you note how uneven the monthly distribution of cargo is in terms of numbers of containers. And that you should be aware, ma'am, that from a production management perspective, it is extremely difficult to have a higher fleet of cranes in one month than what you normally have, or to have to deploy very expensive equipment that only works for a part of the year. So those are the kinds of challenges that the terminal manager has. And these are the sorts of conversations that we often have with the terminal manager. Because industry is saying that they would be prepared to carry part of this risk just to make sure that capacity is available in February when the cargo has to move and not to expect of Transnet to carry all the risk and the cost themselves. So as we improved our understanding over the past five years, we are able now to list and we share this list with Transnet and with the port manager and with the terminal manager. We share this at least once a quarter. We have strategy coordination meetings. So on the top of the list, it's not necessarily in any order of importance. But what you find is that the terminal equipment, these three items I mentioned, the ship to shore crane, the rubber tide gantries, and the haulers, the little tractors that carry the cargo. And obviously there are nuances. So like in the multipurpose terminal, it's a mobile crane, it's not a fixed ship to shore crane. But what we find is if anything goes wrong with that fleet and it's unable to do the work it's supposed to do that day, whether or not it's a technical breakdown on a chain or whether or not it's a flat tire or whether or not we run out of diesel for that shift, that impacts very directly on the volume of cargo that's planned for that day and on the ship that has to be completed that day, and on the trucks that are coming in with containers on their back to be offloaded or picked up that day, and on everything that's going to happen the next day as well because of what's disrupted on this day. So it's interesting when you start looking at this econometrically how almost everything comes back to terminal equipment. And then there's a few relatively simple gate wins. Our port manager will immediately pull my ear and say what you consider to be simple is not so simple because there are um, IT systems involved. TNPA has to have a very specific IT system prescribed in terms of the law. And it's not so easy for a person managing that system as for a person like myself looking out to just put patches on. But from my perspective, when I look at it, it, it would seem like an easy one to coordinate gates of the outside port and inside gate of the terminal, and in that way to improve the management of the transporter flow. I've added this photograph in case it's big enough, just so that you see the truck build up on uh, Duncan Road. And then as that gate coordination becomes disrupted or as the transporter movement becomes disrupted there's a massive increase in bad behavior of the truckers so that you, eventually you don't know who's at blame is it the trucker or is it the, the terminal system but both get one gets as bad as the other and yes there is um, some deliberate uh, illegal behavior like bringing rigs in that are not roadworthy and breaking down in the terminal and causing a blockage for all the trucks behind. So it's a two-edged sword. We still believe that planning and communication between terminal and cold stores about the cargo coming in today and between terminal and the planners on that particular vessel coming in today or tomorrow or next week, that that planning can be improved to remove inefficiencies in the load plans and in the vessel readiness to berth. The moment you bring a, berth, a ship in that's not ready to berth, you almost 
double the time that it's going to take to turn it around. And that's what you want to avoid. We believe traffic management is an easy win, at least if every driver knows exactly where to go to pick up his his cargo or where to drop his cargo and that the movement from gate to stack, we still believe there's some inefficiency that can be removed to improve congestion. Wind and weather, um, Chair, this will remain an issue in Cape Town. Uh, Port Manager has done a huge amount of work with CSIR and last year there was some experimentation with uh, short tensioning units to reduce the ranging, that's the movement of the vessel at birth. And he will probably mention to you that all three berths at the main terminal now have short tensioning equipment. So we look forward this winter to not to have to contend with ranging. And we do believe that that the more we can consolidate the different small transport operators, most of them are like one biz, one man businesses with one truck and trailer, the more we can convince them to work as part of a trucker organization with a set of rules that, that are consistent with the terminal rules, we believe the more we can address the matter of transport of congestion. Just very quickly, Chair, I believe I should be running out of time, but you might be interested in this crossroad we've arrived at now. So we believe container logistics in Port of Cape Town, starting from where the cargo originates, mostly in Winelands, but also in West Coast and Overburg, is about a 75 billion rand industry right up to in the terminal. And we believe that from here to 2026, there are two roads ahead of us. There's a high road and a business as usual bumping along. Um, and the high road can generate more than 6 billion rand more for us than what we have now in gross value addition. It can generate 20,000 new jobs for us, simply out of the growth of the cargo that is ready to be moved in the Western Cape through the port of Cape Town. Those 20,000 jobs can put 2.1 billion rand in the pockets of the employees for those jobs that will be created. And the businesses in this chain Will be, will be paying taxes on their profit to the extent of 1.6 billion to the National Minister of Finance that he can reallocate to schools, not only in the Western Cape, to, to police stations, to hospitals, to deal with many of the social challenges we have. So what is critical, and that's the point that Minister Murray Wenger always makes, is we have to navigate the high road. We have to avoid falling back the default into the low road or bumping along. If we don't manage this intervention, the probability is higher than 50% that we'll default, we'll fall back into the business as usual, which has to be avoided. Ma'am, I'm hastening to finish. This is my second or third last slide where I want to wrap up the current situation. So Port Manager Rajesh sitting to the left behind me, we have a weekly operations coordination meeting with him every Wednesday. He brings more than this room together and we deal with what's happening today, what's going to happen next week, where should we fine tune, where should we tweak, what should we expect. And he runs a quarterly strategy meeting where we sit with different hats on and we just look at the longer term issues that need to be addressed. Chair, um, a minister has expressed her absolute delight at the new leadership team that we met from Transnet. And we do believe that we have found each other. The leadership walk the key. We see them in the terminal. They speak with us about the issues that we see as challenges. They say to us that the Transnet strategy for the Western Cape is aligned with Western Cape Growth for Jobs strategy, and they understand the specific issues, which I'll list in a moment, and we are working together on that. So we had the stakeholder dialogue, but we had a pre-meeting last week, Friday, a week ago, and it was dedicated on alignment and Transnet terminals shared their recovery plan with us. 
And that is what I said I've noticed in the last three weeks, that we've bottomed out on the decline and the first signs of climbing out is emerging. And I'm sure that Oscar will um, share more information with us. And Chair, if you'll allow me just to say that we are delighted that he's back as managing executive. We saw him uh, work this terminal years ago and uh, we have every confidence in Mr. Oscar Vorchitz. We shared with him a list of urgent interventions, and I'll touch on some of that, and he fully agrees that those are going to be our priorities going forward. Last week, Tuesday, we had the annual Port Stakeholder Workshop or Dialogue hosted by Minister, and it was completely agreed that there's this alignment in the Western Cape between the Transnet strategy and the provincial strategy, and that together we are going to work on achieving the best outcome, the growth scenario. And there's Chairman offered an open line of communication between us and his office on all priority interventions, which the minister gratefully accepted and will be working accordingly. And the, the window was opened for partnerships where the private sector, capital investment and technology are needed. Minister Wenger specifically refers to private sector participation. And uh, the chair of Transnet said that Transnet does not have the balance sheet nor the skills to walk this road alone. And it's opening the door for partnerships. We specifically uh, had a look at Balkan Inland Terminal, which is the one of the first evident examples, case studies of such private sector participation. And I know there's more on the way. I know that the term, the port manager is working on Kulemborg and we are anticipating uh, similar types of interventions. Chair, I thought I would just share with you, because I don't think you were in the room, but this is last Tuesday's stakeholder uh, conference. So the way forward, Chair, under point one is just almost like if you, if you like a basket or a wrap up of all the shorter term issues. And here we're speaking about specific efficiency improvement plans, such as working with the terminal manager to reduce the double handling of empty containers, which is a big issue in Port of Cape Town, and other aspects like developing a standard operating procedure for all of industry to work with the terminal on batched cargo delivery and evacuation after an adverse event like shutdown for wind. So more and more of those types of interactions, we are doing a bit of research work. You'll see on the second point, we are developing a digital technology platform to facilitate cargo planning across the entire logistics chain. There's incredibly useful uh, digital planning stuff in Transnet, and we are working with them to extend that so that even the cold store can see how much it's delivering to the terminal tomorrow and how much stack space the terminal has and which ship is waiting outside so that we begin to line up that movement of cargo between point of origin and the vessel. We want to focus on transporter congestion as well. And uh, some of those issues like the traffic uh, management plan is on that list. So for every one of the main interventions, there's a list of short-term interventions. And then uh, Minister Wenger's point about uh, encouraging viable private sector participation opportunities. And, you know, there is a, a recent history of how Transnet was working with the Philippines in Durban, for example, and possibly the Eastern Cape intervention not going as well, even the Durban intervention not going as well as we hoped. So within the Western Cape, the focus will be very much more on making sure the policy framework for private sector participation is sound and in place before there are any interactions with particular terminal operators. And then I think the last point here is this bigger, longer term intervention of integrating the Transnet strategy for all its different operating divisions. So that would mean Transnet Freight Rail, it would even mean Transnet Property. There are several of those operating divisions and Transnet 
uh, port terminals is represented by uh, Mr. Oscar Borchitz behind me. But the idea would be that we don't stay on the terminals alone. We expand this logistics intervention into all of Transnet where it applies to the Western Cape. Chair, thank you so much with, for your patience with me. I apologize if I went over my time. No problem. It's always very interesting getting the update. So thank you very much. Um, we'll now open up for any questions. If members can please raise their hand to indicate if they have any questions for the department. I see Member Van der Vestesen. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I do not know, you know, when to ask which question, because I, I believe there are some more uh, presentations coming. We, as a committee, uh, engaged with the Port Authority last year in, in November. It was the 9th of November, so it's now three and a half months later. And a lot of undertakings were, were made uh, and shared with us regarding the purchasing of uh, uh, equipment, etc. And uh, I would love to hear whether that, that equipment that was about to be imported have landed, whether they have been put into operation, etc. Et I can just say from a layperson's observations, standing there at the quay, uh, looking at the gantry, uh, putting containers onto a ship, between every two uh, containers that were handled, there were a few minutes that went past where the gantry was waiting, for example, for, for the next container to be brought to along the, the, the ship. Uh, I also noticed that the port design provided for at least three lanes for trucks to be able to, to, to line up uh, alongside the, the ship. Yet only one lane was was used, which I presume was due to uh, a lack of equipment. Now, my understanding is that the Port of Cape Town is a profit-making uh, operation and that the income would be uh, able to, to increase tremendously if the greater efficiencies that we strive for can be achieved. So in a sense, uh, I understand the, the balance a, a, a financial balance sheet problems, but you know we we're at a point where it's a it's a, a chicken and egg situation. It seems to me new uh, capable equipment cannot be purchased because of a poor balance sheet. On the other hand, the balance sheet can't improve because of the poor and outdated and and lack of uh, you know well maintained uh, equipment. And my question is just. Is there then no way in which Transnet could be assisted with equipment uh, by, for example, you know, hiring of, of suitable equipment uh, with long-term lease uh, agreements, et cetera, so that it won't uh, affect the balance sheet, but that would it affect first the income sheet by, by, by assisting uh, the port? Um, and obviously, uh, as the minister, or you've quoted the minister saying, if the port works, then obviously the Western Cape economy is, will work as well. So it just seems to me uh, silly to 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 blame the balance sheet uh, and 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 continue uh, struggling along when I believe uh, there is such a lot at uh, at stake and that some uh, big role players would be more than willing to invest money into equipment uh, for, to, 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 for example, also increase the, 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 the profits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Van der Westesen. Member Van der Westesen, on your first question related to um, what has come of the commitments from Transnet for infrastructure upgrades, if you don't mind, we'll hold that until after Transnet um, does their presentation, but we'll allow Dida to come in on the other questions. Um, I understand that Transnet is going to speak to that in their presentation. Member Nkontlo? No, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning once again to the team. Um, uh, I, I think it would help us, I think, because we always have, um, I mean, we have been having these uh, updates uh, to the committee. Indeed, not to always start afresh, you know. I think where we are, and in terms of understanding 
the relationship and the work that has been done. I think from my from my own layman's head, you know, I would I would really uh, uh, um, prefer a simplified approach that says from the last meeting or the last engagement where we were at um, and the resolutions that we agreed upon, um, as also referenced by member Andre Kass with the oversight that we're in. These were the things that we were concerned about as, as the committee, because this is a meeting of the committee. These are the things we're concerned about. These were the things that were promised by Transnet. This is what uh, Transnet and the department, you know, we're going to be engaging in. This is where progress is at. And this is where we're still having work in progress. I think for me, Chair, it's going to reduce these very long presentations, you know, that are technical going back, you know, to previous years, because we know where we are at this point. So if indeed we're trying to resolve a problem, because I'm not, I don't think we're trying to take over Transnet. We're trying to resolve the problems, a problem that has got specific reference to our provincial economy, as it were. So I would like to make that submission, Chair, perhaps um, uh, as we conclude the meeting, so that also we reduce this, uh, the times of these uh, engagements and we are pointed to what we are resolving. That's the first point I wanted to raise. The second one, Chair, is that I'm understanding from the uh, a colleague from, from the department um, that amongst others, because my questions are related to what member Andre Kass, and I'm sure I'll ask them when Transnet has, uh, has come back and made their own presentation on the latest um, uh, promises that we made versus what we, we, we what has been reported about the problems uh, during the season, the season, which needed to have been preempted from the conversation that we had with them. My 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 just two uh, is, is straightforward questions, I think, on this particular presentation, is that one: Would the department say part of the challenge was the relationship issue between the department? and Transnet, and I'm raising this in context that there's a new leadership team, um, uh, which the, the colleague says actually uh, has resulted in some alignment between uh, them, the strategy of the, of the province, and uh, um, uh, what Transnet has presented. And if so, what seems to have been these relationship uh, problems? Is it the individuals on the Transnet side um, were not as uh, um, uh, receptive as the individuals that are in this new team? I'm just interested in, 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 in that um, uh, observation um, that I think came from the report that was just um, uh, being given. And when the colleague uh, mentions the chairperson, uh, uh, are you refer referring to Mr. Sangu, the board chairperson, or if you can give the name of the chairperson you are referring to, because you didn't give a name, so that at least one is able to make to make connection of what is being is is being raised when you talk about the board chairperson. So, am I correct to believe that are you talking about the board chairperson of Transnet, Mr. Sangu, or somebody else? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I don't see any. Further other hands, um, I think just uh, Member Nkuntlo, on your question on updates um, and how we can structure that for future, I think one thing for me that is very helpful in knowing what progress has been made from meeting to meeting is looking at Transnet's eight-point plan um, and comparing it to the previous plan that they report. So they'll do that in the um, next presentation and we can give them an opportunity to inform us of what has changed since they last um, updated us. Um, but with that, I also just want to put some questions forward myself. Um, I wanted to ask the department, in terms of the proposed way forward, um, how does this align with Transnet's um, eight-point plan? What does it add or um, what does it complement? Then um, what does what are the stabilizing factors um, or the, the contributing factors that have resulted to the stabilization that we're starting to see at the port? Um, and then just for me to understand better, um, there was a comment made earlier about Transnet's understanding of the market and how they define the market. Um, I didn't quite grasp that in comparison to how DDAT 
um, defines the market there. Okay, I hope that was clear. I'll hand over um, for the questions and answers. Thank you. So, Chair, um, we'll take, maybe take your guidance on this because some of the questions will be uh, answered in the next presentation on, uh, um, I suppose, on the equipment and all the uh, steps that have been taken by Transnet to um, ameliorate the situation at the Port of Cape Town um, more recently. So, I don't know if that would be helpful for the members if we park those questions until after that presentation, or how would you like us to proceed? Yes, I think we should kind of preempt. Uh, we should definitely hold the questions. Thank you, um, Member van der Vestezen. Um, it just makes sense because if they're going to be answered in any case, there's no point in repeating. The questions from both uh, Honourable van der Vestezen, Honourable Cornwall, and yourself, Chair. Okay. Then the remaining questions will tackle. Chair, the first question is very easy. Yes, it was Mr. Andele's uncle. We were highly honoured that he came to the stakeholder dialogue himself, as well as acting a group chief executive, uh, Ms. Michelle Phillips. That's the simple question. The other questions are perhaps more complex, and um, we could leave them for until after the, the Transnet presentations. Short and sweet. All right, members, then what we'll do just for the sake of time um, and also to ensure that your questions are answered is we'll move straight on to the Transnet um, presentation. And then should your answers still not be addressed, then or your questions still not be addressed, rather, then you can put in new questions to Transnet. Um, I invite the department to stay if you'd like to stay for this briefing in particular. It'd be nice to have you around still. Um, but with that, we'll hand over to Transnet. Thanks and good morning again, Chairperson. Um, and just for the introduction, I am Vernal Jones, the Acting Managing Executive on the Transnet National Ports Authority side. Um, thanks, we, uh, we can just go to the next slide. And I'm sure the, the members, uh, particularly those that have been in these sessions before, uh, would be familiar with some of the content. And I think, Chairperson, as you've alluded, uh, the eight-point plan is contained in the TNPA pack. Um, there have been updates to that from the last sitting. Um, and I think maybe just before I start the formal presentation is there was the previous sitting where Transnet was represented. Um, there were two, to my understanding, two particular actions that came from that. And we can confirm uh, that my colleague Oscar Borchards will be covering it is contained in the presentation, the two action items. And I think uh, just listening to some of the comments now in regard to the equipment, um, you will find that that's coming through. So I think we do stand um, open for any questions. I think once the Transnet presentation holistically has been completed between both the National Ports Authority and our port terminals. Um, then just going through, um, and I'll be very brief, I think, in terms of the port overview, um, the Stakeholders would be aware uh, from a Port of Cape Town perspective, the National Ports Authority is the landlord um, and also owns and then licenses and leases um, terminal operators and then lessees that we then allow certain pieces of the property. So just at a high level, um, the total assets is just less than 16 billion rand um, for the Port of Cape Town. Um, in regard to the total area, just over 9,000 hectares, um, of which the water area is the biggest component thereof. The land area is roughly 620 hectares. Um, there are 42 berths in total, um, and those are spaces where the vessels would be moored. Uh, we have three ship repair facilities. Um, we have our marine fleet. And we will touch on that uh, in the eight point plan a little bit later in regard to the marine services. Um, also, just an important point is that the port currently has 11 licensed terminal operators. Um, and of those, 
we can see the breakdown on the presentation, but more so over that nine of that 11 are private terminal operators. In regard to the port users, um, and I think just to amplify port users, these are activity based licenses um, that we have in the port to which there are quite a few categories. Um, roughly at the moment, they are totaling about 109 licensed operators, and these are all private companies with different activities in the port, and those ranging then from bunkering through to steve stevedoring, the waste disposal, diving licenses, the vessel agent registration, and then the, the more newer activity-based licenses, those are for the hull cleaning, and that is actually what then happens alongside four vessels that are coming into the port, coming to work cargo, that are able to then undertake some level of cleaning for their own efficiencies uh, in terms of one, not only in terms of the fuel efficiency of the vessel, but it also then assists with the carbon emissions that the vessels are having to comply to from an IMO perspective. Um, so just breaking it down in regard to the port activities, we have the freight, um, and I think most for the discussion of today and discussion recently is around containers. Uh, we are also a major liquid bulk um, player in regard to petroleum and edible oils. And then there are a few other commodities that we do within the Port of Cape Town space. Uh, dry bulk, uh, we know that we are, and I think when it actually says agricultural products, these are what's in bulk. Can we just down? Thanks, uh, Brian. Um, agricultural products, um, those that are contained in containers would then be listed as containers um, and not broken down into the dry bulk. And then obviously we have the break bulk. And I think more so over is the, the other services that I've touched on in the licensed operators, and I've broken that down already, that we have 109 of those currently. Um, there's also the fishing um, that we do from an international perspective that is landed, marine engineering facilities that are um, facilitated and assisting the ship repair. And then lastly, the tourism recreational that we also do contribute and form part of. Um, since one of our terminal operators um, being the cruise terminal that is managed and licensed to the VNA waterfront. We can move to the next slide, please, Wayne. So just that uh, broken down again, that's just an overview um, and the picture to the right for the members that have seen it before, that is an extract from our port development framework plan, and that is the current layout as we know it for the Port of Cape Town. There is a red line that runs around it, and that's just depicting our port boundary, or as gazetted would be our port limits. And that is what is in the control um, on the land side for the port authority. And that obviously extends then to seaward, uh, which then covers the entire jurisdiction that TNPA has control both from an authority and from then the office of the harbour master. But I think just noteworthy to note um, in regard to some of the capacities, and I think we will touch on some of that in terms of our eight point plan. On the containers, on the land side, we currently have a capacity of 1 million TEUs. Um, and I think what's important to note is that there are projects that are underway, and I will touch on that when we get there but we have a waterside component uh, that is having a capacity of 1.4 million TUs. That's obviously for the water or ship side. Um, automotive, we know that we, we don't uh, handle automotive products, although they are very few. Um, I think in the current cycle, we've done roughly about seven, um, and these are just large pieces of equipment, but would classify under automotive. The, we then have both the dry bulk and break bulk type activities to which they are 2.1 and 1.5 million tons capacity respectively. And then the liquid bulk, as mentioned, um, there is 3.4 million kiloliters, I think, in respect of that. Just breaking down the terminal operations, I think I've mentioned that already in terms of our private terminal operators, that is nine. And then our public terminal operators, those are two. That'll be for CTCT and CTMPT, respectively. We can move on to the next slide. Thanks, Wayne. So I think, uh, Chairperson, I think this is where we will get into the meat of where we have been and how far we've come with closing some of the particular actions um, in respect to the eight-point plan um, that talks to TNPA and that is being facilitated by TNPA. Um, I think as eloquently mentioned by Glenn in some of the comments that he's already touched on. So I think there's going to be eight 
um, overview points in terms of the eight point plan. The one we'll, we will be dealing with is the immediate crisis management. We'll then move on to the information sharing and the port operations and the visibility around that. We will then touch on issues of the weather and the combating thereof, the terminal equipment and port infrastructure to, to a, uh, some degree, the truck operations, uh, optimization of our marine services, and then last uh, and most important uh, in regard to our people component. And then as we close out the eight point plan, we'll then look at how all of this fits to optimizing in regard to it being a delivery platform. Um, to what we are trying to achieve as TNPA. So just moving to the first one, which talks to the immediate crisis management. Um, we can move over to the next slide, please, we, uh, for the members just to follow. Um, and I think at the time when the last sitting and the presentation was done, our integrated port management system was live. We went live in April of 2023. Um, that was our first phase. We can confirm that there's whilst it is operational and fully operational into phase one, there is considerable work that's happening to get it ready for phase two, and that is for um, other inputs uh, in regard to the integration as what the name intended, uh, as the name mentions, integrated port management, so that we see it as a single view uh, that is within the ambit and control of the port authority. So there has been quite considerable discussions in regard to the terminal operations, the particular systems that they are running and being able to feed that back into our IPMS and then making that visible to our particular stakeholders um, that have access and require access to it. Um, we also have detailed monitoring of the vessels at Anchorage um, and that is obviously an ongoing status. We know that that will fluctuate um, as we've mentioned and I think Len has mentioned in regard to whether weather has a huge impact on our terminal and on our port at large but more so over all vessels that are not able to dock um, do come from the Harbour Master's office and the authority that lies with the Harbour Master in regard to moving those vessels um, and then in consultation with the vessel master. So even at times that we might have a terminal that might be able to work, if it is deemed unsafe for that vessel to dock or sail from the port or into the port uh, by the Harbour Master's office, uh, it will then remain where it is. Um, there continues to be investigation regarding vessels bypassing um, and this started up um, last year. We do know that we've had roughly um, a few vessels in the last period uh, coming through the December, January that have then gone to other ports for the evacuation of fruit and the containers there too, uh, mostly to our Eastern Cape port, but also we found through the port of Durban. Um, in, in addition there too, um, like I say, that is something that we will continue monitor and whatever plans we're putting in place is to ensure that holistically we do not have vessels bypassing. There has already been engagements with some of the shipping lines that has been facilitated by the National Ports Authority and more so over by the port manager um, in regard to just understanding the, the trends that they have when these decisions are made for vessels bypassing or that they are changing particular type of routing and sizing of vessel that might have an impact on our own planning as well, both at the port authority side, but also at the port terminals. Um, there continues to be integrated operations alignment meetings. These are internal to TNPA across all our operational um, departments and portfolios. And this has definitely been working well to ensure that at the start of every shift, everyone is um, well abreast to what the jobs are for the next shift, but also just serves as a handover um, to ensure that we know if there has been any bottlenecks from the previous shift as well. Um, from a TNPA perspective and just um, from our oversight authority that we have as the port authority is that there continues to be monitoring of Transnet port terminals and specifically the container terminal in this case in regard to the performance improvement plan. Um, the and the oversight that the TNPA will continue to do until such time that that we do get it back to the performance norms and as agreed performance standards that we have with the terminal. Um, there has also been in late 2023 an undertaking of a terminal equipment condition assessment that was just a first phase of it. 
Um, we do have the particular outcomes thereof, uh, but I can confirm that TNPA has recently gone out to market as an RFP to further the equipment condition assessments across the Port of Cape Town and more so over across all our ports to one, understand not only the TNPA condition assessment, but also those that are within the ambit of the terminal operators. Um, and as TNPA, we look forward to continually indicating and updating our stakeholders regarding the outcomes thereof. Um, TNPA obviously continues to participate in all the discussions with our partners in the industry, specifically to the agriculture and fruit. Um, and we know that there have been meetings uh, pre the current season. And as mentioned, my colleague Oscar will touch on uh, what it is that had happened um, and what did not go according to plan, but also what are the plans going forward to ensure uh, that we don't land up in a similar situation come to the next citrus season and then into the later 2024 uh, when we find ourselves um, at the deciduous again. Then moving on to the information sharing, uh, there continues to be the weekly engagement meetings, and I think Glenn has already mentioned that. Um, there is the stakeholder workshops that is facilitated by the Port of Cape Town um, and ably chaired by the port manager. Um, and I think it's it's noteworthy to note the quarterly stakeholder engagements and that particular workshop with the eight point plan that we find before us. It is not a transnet plan. It is not a TNPA plan. It is a co-created plan with the integrated stakeholders that form part of that quarterly engagement. And most of these, um, or all of these that have come onto the eight point plan were co-created and the quarterly stakeholder engagement is utilized, that platform is utilized to ensure uh, updates there too, to ensure the validity there too. And if it is that certain actions are now closed and no longer need to be on the eight point plan, they will then find themselves off and if there are new ones that come on to the matters arising, they will then find themselves collectively uh, plotted in the eight point plan at the appropriate place. Uh, there continues to be the further information sharing both at an, a WhatsApp or messaging system, email notifications that go out to all our stakeholders. And that is on a shift by shift basis. So that goes out at a TNPA level at least twice a day. Um, in regard to the emails and our birth planning that goes out uh, per shift, which is also twice a day. Um, and I'm sure TPT would pick up the particular information sharing, which is quite comprehensive to all the stakeholders affected uh, in regard to any notifications where it is of the terminal's concern. Um, the TNPA dashboards that continues to form part of that notification um, there's also the the daily birth planning meetings that is facilitated by the Harbour Master's office and currently chaired by the VTS Deputy Harbour Master um, to ensure that we do have an integrated planning and that stakeholders are then kept abreast of the activities for the next 24 hour cycle. There's also the national daily ops meetings and these are where most of our stakeholders that form part of our weekly engagements do also uh, dial into our national ops meetings. These are facilitated um, every weekday from Monday to Friday at nine o'clock um, where updates are given across the container sphere uh, that's within the control of Transnet. And then lastly, there is also the continuous meetings that continue to happen between uh, SOA and the shipping lines as facilitated by the Harbour Masters Department. Uh, we can move to the next one, please. Thanks. Um, so touching on something very important to Cape Town, and that is weather. Um, and Chairperson, I think just an update to the members that are online as well. At the time that the presentation was completed and submitted, uh, the status of number one has changed. So the short tension units, we can confirm that we have three sets available. All our berths have short tension units on the container terminal and we do await uh, further units that will then be able to be rolled out to the entire port. We know that the area of priority where we find long wave or surging activity is at the container terminal and that is what has been prioritized. So we can confirm that we are ready for the next season, particularly the winter season, 
when these long wave activities um, are experienced through the port. In regard to um, just developments in regard to our craft, we know for combating of the high swells, there is a helicopter that's planned. At this stage, the deployment thereof and the delivery thereof would be next year, and that's roughly in 2025. And the sole purpose thereof would just be to further assist the vessel movement, the movement of our pilots, our marine pilots to and from the vessels, when it is that a pilot boat would not be sufficient based on the swell height. Um, and I maybe just want to, to add um, in regard to this, that the helicopter doesn't now, with having a helicopter in place, doesn't automatically mean that when we have what is deemed adverse weather that the pilot boat's not able to go, that the helicopter becomes the silver bullet. There are still going to be um, parameters that will be incorporated and instituted by the Office of the Harbour Master to ensure that there are safe operating limits for that particular machine when it is received into service. Um, as already alluded to by Glenn, uh, to combat some of the mitigations around wind, the TNPA concluded an MOU with the CSR, and these are with um, some of the, the higher learning institutions um, that are assisting to investigate the effects of wind, more so over then to come up with predictive modeling that will be able to further assist us uh, over and above what we already have in place from the South African Weather Service that does assist and input into our particular systems that we have at our port control um, that talks to the what's referred to as an IPOS, it's an integrated port um, system that actually inputs weather and then determines uh, at a point, particularly for deep draft vessels, whether they are safe uh, and able to, to be sailed. Um, the, the particular work with the CSR will also be assisting with future engineering related solutions. Um, as we know, and as mentioned by our learned colleagues, is that the sea rise would have an impact um, and obviously contributed to by climate change. So the question would then be, as we continue to develop within our key space, um, how does that then mean in terms of our, what we refer to as the, um, the effectively the, the coping heights or the height from the water to the top of the key? And we will hopefully have some uh, further information that will be able to assist us from the infrastructure engineering solutions so that we can become more resilient, not only to the effect of wave condition or water condition, but more so over then to the wind. Um, just going forward in terms of what has been planned and what emanated from the last quarterly stakeholder engagement, there was an update given on the wind study to all our stakeholders um, and what has been concluded from the most recent uh, stakeholder engagement that we've had is that that will be done on a biannual basis. So every six months uh, we will ensure as TNPA um, that we do com communicate to our various stakeholders where we are with a particular study. Um, and I think what's more important is that this is not a study that CSR and TNPA will be doing on their own. There will be interactions with the various stakeholders um, as well affected. Um, where there are information and statistics available, um, these will be part of the contact sessions. And then lastly um, is fog that uh, we've also seen in last month, um, the investigating the impacts thereof and see what possible mitigations could um, be incorporated and integrated into our particular systems that we're able to work because we know that any low lying cloud, both has an effect on, on movement of ships, if it is that it's hampering, and then likewise on the terminal side equipment. Um, then moving on to the, the terminal equipment and port infrastructure, uh, as alluded to when I illustrated the picture on the port development framework plan and the capacities around the port, we currently are undertaking and the lead uh, OD in regard to the container terminal and phase 2B as the project is known. Uh, in that's increasing the land side capacity from 1 million tons to 1.4, apologies, 1 million TEUs to 1.4 million TEUs. Um, and this continues to be uh, updated in regard to information sharing. 
Um, and I think whilst there has been mention, I think, in regard to growth strategies, I will touch on that, that talk specifically to the Port of Cape Town. But more so over, we do through the Port Consultative Committees, to which we are a member, uh, on an annual basis, the TNPA does illustrate its port development framework plans, both in the current state, the short term, the medium term, and then also the long term. And that's also not a plan that is just thought up within the Transnet or TNPA space. There is considerable consultation that is undertaken with various parties to ensure that when these port development framework plans and our capacity that is then responding to certain demand is then appropriate at the particular time. And where so needed, if it needs that certain projects need to come ahead, there is then at the annual port consultative annual roadshow, there's the opportunity for our stakeholders to comment, uh, give guidance, give further input to our particular proposals. And TNPA will then respond accordingly to that in regard to our port development framework plans. Um, the phase 2B obviously has a few components to it, and that is to increase the container stack um, to also then assist with the rail marshalling yard to move and being able to accommodate uh, 50 wagon trains from the current 40, and then to have a permanent truck staging facility. And I think what I will touch on just very briefly uh, when we talk to the port uh, industrial park fairly shortly. Then over and above that, I'll try and just pick up the pace a little bit, Chairperson, is monitoring and the implementation of our terminal operators investment plans, uh, more so over for the two Transnet port terminal facilities, and then our fruit produce terminal or, or FPT as it's referred to, where it has an impact on the fruit and the agriculture that is being exported out of the port of Cape Town. So that links itself not only in terms of its investment plans, the maintenance there to refurbishment plans. Um, these are then taken through on a quarterly basis uh, into what is referred to also as the port consultative uh, committee that then looks at the KPIs and the subcommittee then to the PCCs. So over and above our oversight that we do within the port structures as TNPA, there is continuous and transparent information being shared with our particular stakeholders. Um, we are also happy to report uh, regard to refurbishments on the long key um, is the F berth, and that is the berth that is predominantly on CTMPT used for containers, that there was a complete refurbishment undertaken and complete. Um, J berth has subsequently also been completed, and there will then be continuous work that will be happening along the long key um, at the berths um, that have not yet been attended to. In the 2023 current financial year, 2023-2024, in the latter part of 2023, there was also some dredging undertaken by Transnet, uh, via internal dredging services, and that was to bring the berths back to promulgated depth. Um, there was also, in terms of its initial project phase and timeline, um, quite reduction in regard to how quick we were able to undertake that particular dredging alongside the key and the basin um, that then assists us. Um, and we know that it then came at a time when the particular the terminal operator, the shipping lines, then requested us um, to actually not undertake the dredging at that particular time. And we do, I think, as the National Ports Authority, um, understand in terms of depth management, but more so over the safety aspect that goes with it and need to continuously do that. Um, there's also the work that's are currently being undertaken in regard to the designing and the construction of a traffic circle that's in Duncan Road, and that's obviously been to facilitate the interim truck staging facility that we have. We can move to the next slide, please, for you. Um, so the interim truck staging facility, this was completed and would have been reported in the last uh, period that it is complete. And I think I've just alluded to the traffic circle that is then to further then assist the traffic management and flow of the particular trucks uh, through that particular area. Um, there's continuous work to reduce the, the flows um, at peaks, um, and the TPT, my colleague Oscar, will allude to what work is being undertaken in regard to their gate management um, to further assist. Um, there's also the continuous work 
um, and facilitation in and around the 24-7 and what is referred to as the night runs. Um, and whilst there's been a small increase in that, it is not yet to the levels that we desire uh, from a port perspective. And, and we will touch on that, I think, when TPT gives uh, the particular presentation. The truck booking system, um, I'll leave that to TPT. But the component that talks to TNPA, there is um, current discussions quite at an advanced stage um, for the TNPA perimeter access control to have access to the Transnet port terminals Navis system, and more so over um, with the Navis experts that we have in the country at the moment, or the TPT has in the country, to see if we can find an optimal solution. And that will really just be assisting for TNPA to have sight of those vessels, uh, of those trucks that are then called, particularly for stacks, either to come and pick up cargo or then deliver containers uh, into the container terminal. Uh, the traf traffic management and the smart traffic, uh, there's continuous work that's happening in and around that. That is an initiative that's driven by our ICT as TNPA. Um, and in 2024, we're hoping that we will be able to communicate the further updates, I think, in regard to that. Um, and then we continually participate uh, with the facilitation around the construction of the truck stop as initiated by the city of Cape Town, because we understand the any impact that there is from the port, where we are windbound and weatherbound, that those trucks need a place to, to go to. Um, and then lastly, I think, is the issue around possible formation and establishment of an umbrella trucking association. Uh, TNPA hosted um, and successfully so um, an inaugural comprehensive um, engagement with the trucking fraternity, not only those that were forming part of our general meetings um, and safe to say that there is also uh, a further engagement tomorrow that TNPA will be hosting around that as well. Uh, we can move on. Then just looking at our marine services, um, we have a fleet complement of four tugs that are stationed in the port, of which three are continuously on shift, um, and that obviously supplemented by our birthing services. Um, and, and I'm particularly using the word birthing services, um, having recently been in a session um, with the with the provincial government where the word, and, and more so over last week, I was fortunate enough uh, to be accompanying our acting group chief executive um, to the city of Cape Town and meeting with the executive mayor when the word gang is being used. And I think whilst it's an appropriate term for us within an operational environment, um, we will look at how we can possibly phrase that differently going forward. Um, so our birthing services and our mooring teams, uh, we do have three of those um, that are on shift at any one time. And we also have a standby team that is supplemented from that birthing gang that actually then assists and stands by for the short tension devices. Uh, there's continuous monitoring from our oversight perspective on our marine services operation, and that's looking at any delays that our marine services then impacts any vessels either having to come into the port or sell from the port. Um, we can confirm, and I think just to close up the tugs, um, whilst it is then talking to point number four in regard to long-term fleet management contracts that we are concluding, uh, we have recently, since last week, brought another tug to supplement the fleet in the Port of Cape Town, and that's just to assist us um, to ensure a continuous three-tug operation. Um, and that's then to, to assist for our tugs to actually go up onto the slip uh, and go into dry dock to perform their various maintenance activities. And just to close out in the Marine Fleet, uh, we have two particular small craft that will be coming into operation. Um, so the two launches that are due in 2024, in the next few months we anticipate, and that will then be able to replace um, some of the older fleet uh, that we have on the two launches, and then anticipating for 2025 that we'll have two new workboats as well. Um, as mentioned, our critical and most important resource and capacity is then of people, that there is continuous uh, development and pipeline development of our critical skills around marine uh, engineering and marine resources, and then on the engineering and infrastructure component. Um, there's also been a drive to, to fill these vacancies within our port operations and those that are critical and critical safety uh, to our various activities. 
Uh, TNPA has also successfully launched an incentive scheme to the bargaining unit employees uh, in the current financial year of 2023 and 2024, and that would have been reported in the last uh, reporting period. And I think just to close out on the people uh, and the particular drive from the Port of Cape Town, ably led by the port manager by Mr. Rajesh Dana, is the drive um, for culture, service excellence and customer centricity. And the call to action is doing more faster. And the mantra is all hands on deck. And I think that is, you know, going back to the basics and ensuring that we do what needs to be done. And then lastly, Chairperson, I think as I get to concluding on the uh, last slide of the eight point plan is then the continued use of a berth for operations. Uh, we know that that is having a short term lease to one of our terminal operators and the work and there is work currently underway um, for an RFP to go to market fairly soon in regard to a long term plan in regard to a berth. I've touched on the development uh, and I spoke to the Port Industrial Park or the PIP site as it's referred to. Um, and there has been updates to the last quarterly stakeholder engagement, both on the PIP site and in the Kulemborg area. And that to see how it can aid and address some of the port congestion issues, but more so over that it will actually form part of being a logistic solution that the TNPA Port of Cape Town will be offering to its stakeholders. Um, there's also been, and I'm sure it would have been reported, we had commenced a international benchmarking. This was undertaken uh, by PwC on behalf of TNPA, and we have had extensive engagements with all our stakeholders, including terminal operators that were affected and ones that were not forming part of the study. The best practice that came from that, and we're now rolling out the implementation and the recommendations from that particular benchmarking exercise that TNPA had initiated and will be forming part of some of the target setting that we're currently uh, concluding with our terminal operators that will see itself into their performance standards for the next year and years thereafter, um, where we are quite a bit away from the international norms in regard to some of the KPIs. Um, the TPT will cover, I think, in terms of NAVIS and the work that they're doing both on the prime route and the expert decking. Um, and I think the facilitation that we continuously do uh, with all our stakeholders and talking to the understanding the process flows, the mapping of the fruit through a transport, transport logistics chain. And I think with this, we can confirm as TNPA, um, similar to what we've undertaken in late November of 2023, uh, when we were looking at the container matters and, and giving information regarding that, we can confirm that not only for the Port of Cape Town, but for all our ports, we are now actively monitoring not only the container vessels, but container vessels specific to breaking down the fruit component thereof. There has been engagements with our industry partners in regard to that, and specifically on the on the FPF side, and we will continually receive uh, the updates and engage the relevant stakeholders. What it is we are trying to do from an oversight perspective as TNPA, in regard to not only understanding the process flows and the mapping thereof, but to ensuring that we are able to see a more fluid logistic solution in regard to the managing of fruit. Because we know that this is not only in the container form, but it is also in palletized conventional form. So we need to ensure that we actually look at both facets thereof and not only on the containers. Um, then just closing out then to the next slide would be the growth strategy for the Port of Cape Town, and this is something that has been developed um, and updated in the current financial cycle. It has already been in place um, that I need to stress, uh, Chairperson, the Port of Cape Town's growth strategy, and I think we can call it different naming conventions, but there's always been a strategy for the port, and there's always been a strategy for the TNPA um, that does align to our transnet strategies. And I think just at a high level, I'm not going to go into all the points on the right hand side, but the fire, the four key elements is on revenue diversification, because we do understand um, the role that the Port of Cape Town plays and specifically around containers, uh, but more so over as we see different markets and different opportunities that the port is needing to respond to. Um, and you can see the particular points on the right hand side. 
capacity creation and I think in regard to the port development framework plans I've already touched on that I've touched on the container terminals phase two expansion the optimization at the multi-purpose terminal I've spoken to a birth and I think the cruise facility that we have we've spoken to and more so over, I think on the Kulemborg back of port logistics that talks to both how it will assist as a logistic solution um, looking at the financial sustainability of the port and then lastly closing out on the operational excellence and I think whilst the focus is around um, you know a lot of the exports that we're doing we can't negate the fact that there are other industries that do utilize the port and I touched on those activity-based licenses up front um, and that is then for the introduction of 10 portal harbor cranes and that will then be deployed to our two ship repair facilities our graving dock facilities being the Starock dry dock and then the um, Robinson dry dock respectively um, and we continuously then have engagements on a weekly basis on a Wednesday uh, with our industry partners in the ship repair environment as well then chairperson I think I'm definitely also now out of time but I think let me conclude um, the port of Cape Town strategy that we are continuously enabling ourselves to be a global premium fruit and agriculture export hub uh, to ensure that we are diversifying ourselves from an energy perspective for the Western Cape and complementing our port on the West Coast being the port of Saldana. Um, the container terminal we know that we have in the port of Cape Town and the importance thereof to the Western Cape, but ensuring that there is a multi disciplinary and multi-commodity mix that we have through our MPT facilities that is both able to handle dry bulk and break bulk um, that talks to our agriculture uh, for the port and then being a leading boat building and ship repair hub in sub-Saharan Africa and then lastly I think as I touched on some of these elements already is to be able to see ourselves as a smart people's port focusing on cruise real estate development recreational and tourism uh, chairperson with that I will conclude for the TNPA component of the presentation thanks thank you very much I know that we still have another presentation but I'd like to propose that we just take a quick 10 minute breather grab some coffee use the bathroom um, also so the sign language can have an opportunity to relax they've been non-stop thank you very much um, we'll just take 10 minutes if you can come back at let's say quarter two yeah yep thanks everyone Thank you. 
take you through.
teams. It will be addressed in terms of how we've improved our weekly throughput, and you'll get that on slide 10. Next slide, please. The truck turnaround time, uh, it was 68. Currently, we at 51 minutes. Last week, we've done a total of 8, 000, almost 8,000 uh, containers versus an average of 5,500. So you can definitely see that the, the throughput through the port in terms of trucks has increased over the last week. 8,000 was managed, and we could see that we could do it in 51 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, that's the vessel turnaround time. Uh, you can see that was 82. Uh, as we stand now, it's down to 57 uh, hours. Um, it's not the ideal. However, what we want to present, that is a progressive improvement. We have seen signs of bottoming out of the uh, of the operation, and the slide 10 will obviously show that uh, progression. Next slide, please. The average waiting time um, is now down to 144 hours. I must also say that right now we have an empty berth. We're actually waiting for a berth to to arrive. Uh, the one the one vessel outside is an early arrival. So, and that is just signs that in terms of how we've reduced the anchorage time um, to the level that we are now waiting for a vessel. Thank you. Um, the import dwell times, I'm not going to go into that one. I would rather want to go to the meaty stuff on slide 10. If you can just allow me. Yeah, that is, that is where we are. If you can look at um, what we said is uh, from December onwards and the improvement uh, the average to use per week. Um, you can see how we have improved over the last few weeks and is on a weekly basis. Uh, the 16,000 TUs, that's we've done in the last two weeks. Now that's a sign of improvement. Um, that's in line with budget. I would love to see that that um, improvement goes up on a continuous basis. You can see on the bottom is the every daily moves um, for the week. Um, it's now to 1,200, it's now sitting at 1,300 on average per day. What we do is the uh, to address the, uh, the impact to imports and exports, we concentrate on the number, number of containers that we move. That's a good indicator that we service our importers, exporters, um, arrest the uh, waiting time and, um, and really make an impact. Um, to everybody in the system. You can see also the target, um, if you look at the vessel uh, status, uh, we're sitting on average around about three at average. As I said this morning, we have one early arrival, and I'll repeat again, we have an open berth waiting for a vessel. So if if you look at where where we are, and it's a consistent improvement over the last three weeks, and we'll continue on that basis. And and really what, and I need to just spend time in in what has done that, how did we change? And how are we changing, busy changing? Um, we have asked for collaboration. We have a daily, uh, what we call a war room with the fruit industry to really understand what's happening with inside the minds of the pack houses, um, exporters, where it's, the fruit is picked. Um, now, if if you look at the previous uh, December, January, beginning of January, was quite challenging. And what we're doing now is to arrest the latter part of the deciduous fruit and to bring confidence in. And what we're doing is we, we're working jointly with shipping lines, working jointly with exporters, jointly with the fruit exporters per se to understand and see how we can help. That is proven to to be quite to going quite well. Um, what we've also said in terms of the RTGs, the secondhand RTGs from LA, those seven RTGs they've arrived operational. So I can say that the your rubber tight gantry fleet has increased and that's a welcome change in terms of more fleet. We have more redundancy. Um, we still experience some equipment breakdowns, albeit now we have a bigger fleet to 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 operate. Um, I must also say that the the new fleet for the rubber tight gantry that order was placed on the sixth of December, 
The first batch we should see by the end of next year. Unfortunately, it's an 18 to 20 month lead time. So um, in the meantime, while we wait for the new ones, um, the seven extra RTGs will then support. On the, on the Navis optimization, we have this the experts in the port the last month and a half, and is really to optimize the system. Where can we improve systems? What can we do better? And we have seen some some amazing uh, impact on that. And it's really using the system to move containers better, where to place using the yard, better vessel planning. Um, that is comfort. And then those particular skills are now being transferred to our own planners because we we did find there were some skills that's that's needed, and we can see that coming through. There was a lot of management and supervisor and labor engagement. Labor is on board. Um, and I must say also we're meeting twice uh, every two weeks. and it's a it's a combination from labor, private sector, shopping lines, internal, external. And we're trying to say, where can we improve? I must say that the, la the hand has been extended to private sector involvement. And uh, we've already seen some great improvement in terms of assistance, in terms of equipment has come through. Uh, and we, I, I can just look forward to better participation with the, with, with the private sector. Um, in terms of continuous improvement, we have uh, industrial engineers on site to help us with processes cutting down waste. We have improved communication. We've also increased technical skills, um, artisans, uh, mill rights coming into play. We've moved that contract faster to come in mid-Feb. Uh, there's a new batch of, of new employees coming in starting the 1st of March as well. We currently, we have Liber, which is OEM on site, and we're currently busy to, to, to get more onto um, onto the site to actually help us. In terms of the nitrons, that's planned nitrons. We are planning with the shipping lines, with the fruit for nitrons. We have seen some, some, some improvement. I would love to see more coming out of that. Um, order has been played for the new haulers. They are coming only in June 2024. In the meantime, we've gone to, um, to our partners to solicit 15 more haulers. We've got some good feedback from one and the, the other party is ju currently just waiting from a legal lease lease agreement. And I'm, I'm confident that in the next week or two, we should get some finality. With that coming into that our fleet will then be, will then be improved. So I think where we are at, at this at this point of time, there's a lot of things still to be done. I'm not saying we've arrived there. What I'm saying, I'm confident that we are pulling the right strings. We are focused on the respective areas. And even going forward in terms of with the new technical uh, staff coming in, I foresee that we ha will have more uptime in terms of our equipment. We have planned for a refurbishment of at least one to two cranes this year. And the idea is for the deciduous uh, the fruit season directly after that. We are planning to engage the, the fruit industry again to plan for the next season. What it means is that we can put our systems in place and to do just that. Uh, in the future, we're also planning for an eight gang. And that brings in capacity so that we can actually um, improve productivity, but also provide more capacity to handle fruit. What I've said in the early engagement as well is that we have wind. You can't do anything about it. What do we do in the nine months that we do not have wind? And that is, that's where our focus is, is. I believe with collaboration, with participation, and really extending our hand um, and really an open an open system. There's a lot of skills outside. There's a lot of side and, and, and brain power that we can work together. And that is exactly what we are doing. Thank you so much. Just check is um, Smakumalo 
going to be representing I'm going to be providing this presentation. Well, on the next presentation, no. Okay. No. Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, we can go to the first slide. I can't see that far. Is that Ms. Kamalo? Yes. Uh, am I audible okay. now? Yes, you're audible. Okay, um, I'll hand over to you to finish up this last presentation and then we'll take um, questions from the members. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'll try and be brief uh, because uh, some of the slides have been presented before. Um, our focus is still on the um, um, uh, growth on the agricultural uh, products that um, are within the, the, the region. Uh, our focus is still to get all the traffic, um, or, or not even all, most of the traffic uh, from road to rail. And um, the reason for that uh, is to assist us to densify the lines, uh, because we do have quite a lot of uh, branch lines that are underutilized at this point. And uh, it then makes the cost of doing uh, the business a bit higher. So for us to be cost effective and efficient, um, we are focusing on the road to rail. Uh, so that we can at least improve uh, in, on the utilization of those branch lines, which will then assist us to reduce uh, the cost. Um, we do have a, a number of opportunities in the different areas. Um, I think the other thing that we're mostly focusing on as well is on the asset utilization. Uh, because we do have uh, assets that are already allocated to us, but because of the volumes that are not at the level that we want, uh, we are then not optimally utilizing them. So we are having a drive on that as well. And also um, it, it redistributing the, the risk uh, with assistance uh, from PSPs. Um, there is a number of initiatives that uh, we are currently working on as well. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right, so on the on our proposition, um, we are focusing on the challenges that we are having, uh, where we are having a number of uh, smaller trains that we are running in the different bridge lines, um, which are not really uh, cost effective. Uh, so the intention is to consolidate uh, the small trains uh, into longer trains uh, so that we can be able to at least uh, improve on the optimization on the utilization of the assets uh, and also um, get the maximum uh, work on payload uh, on the different trains. Um, hence, we are looking at consolidating on the different hubs so that we can be able to run the longer trains. And also um, when we move the traffic, we do have the resources available to move the traffic and we are able to then uh, cover more um, at a goal. Um, I think the other challenge uh, that we are currently faced with as well is that uh, on the agricultural side, uh, the products are seasonal. So you'll find that the resources that are allocated, uh, you can be able to utilize them uh, only for a certain period. And the rest of the other months, you are not able to utilize them anyway because uh, those agricultural products are not available. So these are some of the issues that we um, are faced with. I think I've already spoken about the operational cost, um, which is another issue that we are faced with, and also uh, the limited investment um, on the infrastructure, which has made uh, our infrastructure not to be at the correct standard. So um, this is another challenge that we are faced with, but uh, there is some engagements that are happening, uh, especially as I've indicated on the branch lines that the focus is on the PSPs as well, which will then assist us uh, to improve um, uh, the, 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 the infrastructure on that side. Um, we can go to the next slide. If we look at the containers, um, we do have Belcon uh, terminal. Uh, I think we did indicate in the previous um, meeting uh, that we were looking at um, <clears throat> awarding um, different um, uh, different stake. Uh, we were looking at awarding uh, some some tenders 
to to different companies. There is Musk that is already uh, awarded, which they've already started doing some development work there. Uh, there is a land of around 160,000 square meters that was awarded. And um, what they have committed uh, to offer um, in their space is the warehousing, the cold storage, the river capacity, and um, a, a container depot. Uh, there's co they've committed as well, and I think on the phase one of their commitment, oh, load shedding. Can I just check if I'm audible? Yes, you're still audible. My apology, we just went into load shedding. So so what has happened on the MERS side is that um, they had indicated that they will be constructing a wash bay and the river towers, um, and they would be completed by end of October. That has happened. Uh, they are now busy with the uh, phase two uh, of the construction. And... Um, <clears throat> Their volume commitment is only effective uh, from 2025, 20, 26 financial year. So we still have another year that we have to wait. Uh, but there is small movements that we are seeing when it comes to uh, volumes that are coming through Belcon uh, for the port. Uh, the second one uh, is the warehouse uh, that was awarded to Titan Cargo. It's around 90,000 square meters um, and the construction phase is still underway. And we are expecting that they should be um, operational. The first phase of the years uh, is indicating by mid-2024. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. So this is just um, a similar uh, view, but uh, obviously with an aerial view of the actual complex that we are working with. So when it comes to Belcon Terminal itself, we currently do have uh, the capacity uh, to run shuttle services. Um, if I look at the period uh, between December um, 11 up until the 21st, we've already managed to 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 move about 2,836 TEUs of reefers, which equates to 32,000 um, um, tonnages uh, from uh, the rail side, um, and we are doing that through uh, the port of Cape Town. We do have a, a refer capacity uh, black point uh, of 96 that we've improved to 144, and that has yielded us some very much good results. I think the only constraint that we're currently sitting with that we are trying to mitigate uh, is on the backup um, or, or generators uh, uh, for us to actually uh, at least improve uh, on this TEU. So there is some work that is being done on that side as well. Um, and we've also amended our working hours uh, where we are now available to work from Monday uh, to Saturday uh, day shift and also Monday to Friday night shift as opposed to the only five day week uh, day shift only that we used to work. Thanks. Oh, OK, let me go to the next slide. I'll move on this one. I'll just take it as red. Um, you can go to the next one. All right, I think one of the major issues as well that we are faced with, it is the security incidents where we have in a number of cable theft and sabotage that is happening, especially between um, Belleville uh, up to Beaufort West. We've had a number of cable thefts uh, that have really uh, hindered the performance uh, of rail. Uh, impacting some of the traffic that goes into the port of Cape Town. Um, but the implementation of the OPS contract um, has really assisted us. There is a very big improvement. Uh, we are coming from an era where we had uh, about three to four uh, cable theft or vandalism uh, incidents a day uh, to at least two a week. Um, so there is an improvement. There is still some work that is being done. There's a joint corridor co co command center that is uh, underway. It's being established uh, just to assist with all the monitoring and um, just to assist in also managing the quicker response time with the service provider. And some intelligence as well that the guides have implemented to assist us to improve on the security uh, incidents. I think that should be my the last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
With that, um, we'll now move on to questions from the members. Uh, members, if you can please raise your hand to indicate whether you have any questions. Um, I'd like to ask that we limit questions um, for each round to three questions, um, and then we can always come back uh, for subsequent rounds. The first hand I see is Member Nkontlo. Member Nkontlo, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, sorry, Chair. Yes, I, I do have questions. I've not raised my hands. I think I had an old hand that I withdrew. Uh, but uh, thank you for the for the for the presentations. Um, I think my first uh, question, having received the three uh, presentations, uh, mine, I think will go back uh, for the colleagues after everything they've explained um, to just indicate um, that from the conversation, because I hear that uh, in terms of uh, fleet, uh, there is some improvement. There are others that are still ordered, uh, that are still to arrive, if I understood, understood uh, well uh, from uh, the, the, the last presentation made. Um, uh, what I'm interested to understand is that from the from the the expected or anticipated uh, season fruit season, um, what has been you know the shortfall? Because I think we read also in newspapers others I think even. Um, uh, threatening to take legal action because they argue 60% of losses. Is that the case? And for me, Chair, that is what I'm always interested in here, is, is actually to just do a simple the, um, before and after. The last uh, understanding of what was planned, what happened, what were the shortfall during the season, particularly the season that had started um, in December uh, for the for the fruit uh, growers? I think I'm interested to understand what were the problems and what's the extent uh, of those uh, particular uh, problems. Um, whilst I hear that that there is work, and I think one is welcoming uh, uh, such. Uh, so that's the that's the first question that I would like uh, to, to 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 get uh, some some answers uh, on, and then I think um, in terms of the waiting times, that's the second question I just wanted to understand because I think the cry is always uh, about uh, that. That um, I think part of the problem of the uh, old infrastructure has contributed uh, much, I think, on the on the waiting times. And that links, I think, to the last presentation on the TFR and the work that they are doing, which I think, as it's indicated, it is not necessarily at the ideal state um, uh, required. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, in terms of the engagement with industry, what has been, I mean, the agreed uh, and the reasonable waiting times um, um, uh, uh, for some of the of the of the of the shipments that needs to be made, and uh, through from a transnet point of view, are we adhering to that? Uh, are we meeting that? And if not, you know what seems to be the problem and the extent uh, of that of that problem. And I think those would be just my first questions at this point, Chair, because I'm taking to cognizance that even in our SOPA, both the Premier and the Minister would have raised exactly the same issues, you know, uh, to even a point where the Premier in his state of the province addressed um, uh, says uh, the targets that have been agreed in the pod, uh, dashboard as an optimization sort of tool have um, none of them have been met. And I'm interested from Transnet point of view to then um, respond uh, on this um, uh, assertion made by the Premier that none of the targets have been met, that why are we having such a situation if there has been agreed targets met, you know, through the dashboard as a tool agreed upon by all stakeholders, you know, but um, at the level of the, uh, the Premier of the province, I think there's an observation that uh, none of the targets are being met. Why is that so? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Member and Kuntlo. Um, in the very season. Yes, thank you, Chair. And again, thank you for those presentations. Um, uh, unfortunately, some of my questions have not been addressed. Uh, I, I did hear, uh, and please just confirm, that the used equipment purchased that we heard about three and a half months ago did arrive, and that equipment has been put to good use. Uh, so uh, can I ex assume that the equipment when it arrived was then uh, ready to put to uh, to work immediately. Uh, then secondly, Chair, uh, we, we've been served with a lot of statistics, and I love statistics, but may I say things like average waiting time for births, truck waiting time, and so on. Um, for me, you know, these are the kind of figures that can be influenced also by inefficiencies. If, if people say, well, listen, it's no, I'm, I'm rather going to drive to Port Elizabeth or I'm, I'm rather going to put my freight on, uh, on an aeroplane or whatever the case may be, uh, these obviously, or, or ships that sell and say, we're not going to dock at, at Cape Town port, uh, we're going to pass Cape Town. Obviously, that would then also show as an improvement in average waiting time for births or truck waiting time, etc. Et, et so for me, uh, there are a few of the statistics that 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 I believe are really measuring uh, what we want to know, and that is, for example, the the TEU or container a number of containers handled every day or per week or, or per month, etc. Now, I'll also note that the vessel turnaround time, and I presume that is uh, once the vessel has entered the, the, the port and uh, again left the Cape Town port, perhaps you could just uh, inform us of your definition of that. But that is still way above the, the target. Uh, again, uh, if you, I could just hear, is that target a, a self-determined target? Uh, we also heard that there were, have been international benchmarking studies. Uh, what was the target for vessel turnaround time uh, as determined in terms of, of international targets? And, and if you say you've moved so many containers, is a movement uh, uh, measured as a container being put onto a ship or a container removed from a ship. Chair, perhaps uh, taking into account your, your limit of three questions, let me first pause there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member. Um, I would just like to add a few questions of my own. Uh, so my first question was looking at, I can't remember the exact slide, um, but it's back to a decline in birth and anchorage between the 21st of Jan 2024 and the 7th of Feb 2024. So I just wanted to understand um, what were the contributing factors towards that decline, also noting that there are currently no ships at birth. So why is that? Um, what planning should have possibly taken place? What inefficiencies might have contributed to this? Um, then... On the um, vessels bypassing Cape Town, um, if I could get a bit more information, um, I recall a while ago when, when Durban was experiencing significant backlogs, um, there was discussion with the National Command Centre about whether some ships could be sent to Cape Town. Um, but this wasn't necessarily, it didn't, it didn't play out this way. Um, and it would just be helpful to know um, what the cause behind ships bypassing Cape Town is. For me, I see opportunity. Um, unfortunately, we do see havoc in the Red Sea, but why is that not a, possibly an opportunity for, birth, for more births to come our way? Or um, when uh, Durban, for example, experienced its backlog, why couldn't we absorb more um, ships that that related to the same sort of containerized equipment that we took. Um, then I'd also just like to touch on um, average total turnaround time. 
So one thing that I've seen um, in the data that I've been collecting is that there's a trend that total turnaround time reaches up to four times the target over um, busier periods, especially December and January. And I just wanted to know what the reasons for this were um, and also what steps have been taken um, to provide capacity during these periods. All right, I hope you've managed to write down those questions or make a note. Um, we'll hand back now. Uh, Chair, my apologies. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, my is that hands, Isaac? May my select me, please. Uh, thank you very much. Now, Chair, mine is, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity. Mine, Chair, is sweet and short, and it's just based on the um, eight-point plan, and I just wanted to get in, in uh, a feeling from, from Transnet whether they are satisfied in the manner and how uh, the eight point plan is progressing currently. And then if not, why are they not happy? And secondly, Chair, in terms of table, uh, cable theft and vandalism, sabotage and theft in general, uh, would they say that the measures that they have put in place, you know, is actually assisting them in dealing with these particular issues that they have raised? Those were, those are my two questions, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Member Seleko. Uh, we'll hand back to Transnet. Through the chairperson, thanks for the questions. Um, and I think some are going to be touching over both TNPA and TPT. Um, so I think maybe just on the equipment, whilst Oscar might have touched on it, um, Oscar, I will ask that you maybe just pick that one up in terms of the equipment, um, because I think that one sits in, in your ambit. Um, also, in terms of the waiting time um, and all the infrastructure and how that affects, I think that was a comment. Um, I think more so over is the targets that are not being met. Is this true? Um, so we can confirm that from a ship turnaround perspective, we've seen that the targets as achieved are higher. And there are factors to that. So we spoke about the effects of weather and more so over with wind. Um, and I think there was a question that I'll try and tie up, which was the definition around ship turnaround time. So the honorable colleague was correct. It is from the time that the vessel has crossed the breakwater inward to the time that the vessel passes the breakwater outward. So it's the total time of the vessel that is then classified as the total turnaround time of the vessel. And it does not include any deductibles. So whilst the vessel might be alongside, the agreed targets, and I'm hoping um, Oscar will just pick that up, that are specifically commercial targets between the terminal operator and the shipping line per se, um, that they will then talk to some of the performance measures but the ship turnaround time is a measure that we um, measure as TNPA. Um, it has no deductible. So if a vessel is then hampered by wind, similar to how we would have had in January, the vessel, the time does not stop. The terminal might have a different calculation in regard to some of the performance measures and the agreed commercial undertakings in terms of what classifies as deductibles in their commercial agreement. So to be able to stick to certain targets, we can look at the, the weather, we can factor that in. And the question then comes, why would we have a shift in around time figure that is then exponentially higher than what it is internationally? And I think that is what we are attempting to do as TNPA um, with our, firstly, the line of, and, and the chain in terms of the communication and interaction and setting of the target is with the terminal operator because that is the lessee and also licensed operator as issued by TNPA. And whatever has been agreed upon then goes into a open stakeholder process, which is our port consultative KPI subcommittee. So whatever targets are agreed upon for the next cycle, for an example, which is what we will go into as our terminal operator performance standards for year 12, and that is what commences in April, we will then communicate what are the proposed targets. So those targets have always been 
visible and transparent to our stakeholders. Um, but I need to emphasize, Chairperson, the issue of, of the deductible, that there are no deductibles. If a vessel is stuck alongside and we have adverse weather for 30 hours, the 30 hours continues to put it onto the clock. Um, the issue around um, the inefficiencies, yes, it definitely has a, a bearing if there are inefficiencies, how it will negatively impact the KPIs. Um, the how this, and I think I've, I've tried to link it back to the, the question from um, Honorable Mr. van der Westeisen. Um, so yes, the interna international benchmark that we have concluded as TNPA, as undertaken by PricewaterhouseCooper um, that I alluded to, has particular norms. Um, we have also seen, and uh, TPT has previously reported in these forums, the work that they're doing in regard to the World Bank, the outcomes and the work that they've done with the World Bank. I'll leave that to Oscar to, to communicate. Um, but more so over that we're using that as a, a, a target tool as well. Um, there are different measuring criteria and different definitions that are used by the World Bank in regard to the vessel arrival. They do not recognize early arrivals. They do not recognize the vessel that is unplanned and then comes for an unscheduled stop. They will see that as a time clock start until the vessel then eventually departs if it does do cargo. So I think sometimes when we're reading these different reports, we need to just understand the actual elements that go into the analysis and then the outcomes and recommendations that we see. But we can confirm, I think definitely from a TNPA perspective, um, Oscar will talk to the TPA, TPT component, but we are recognizing certain um, elements that we can take on board, and we are factoring that with our benchmarking study as TNPA that we've done. And I just need to conclude, uh, Chairperson, is that when we also engage the stakeholders, there were 14 terminals that we had chosen across the five different commodity streams, but when we came and did the feedback, it was comprehensive feedback in all our ports, not only for the Port of Cape Town, but for the Western region that we are serving from a TNPA perspective. All our terminal operators were engaged, thoroughly engaged in regard to that, and we further took it through a PCC KPI subcommittee. So the, the level of transparency and even the report itself was made available. So everyone actually has a copy of that report by PwC. Um, I think I've touched on the the turnaround time, I think if there is any follow-ups, we can come back to it. Um, the the issues of the vessels bypassing, um, and this makes for an interesting analysis as to which period we're looking at. So there was the initial one that came round about the COVID and post-COVID, and we did a bit of analysis on that at a very high level. And I think just at a, at a glance in 2022, 53% of the vessels that bypassed the port of Cape Town in that period was solely dependent on the shipping lines decision. Either by having to stick to a particular schedule or what is referred to as blank sailings. So they will swap out different vessels to in, uh, maintain certain schedules. Um, if we bring that closer to where we are now in the vessels bypassing, um, we can't speak on behalf of the shipping lines, but it does become an economic decision that they make. There was a session that we participated in as TNPA. There were some of the other Transnet colleagues that was recently undertaken by the Cape Chamber. And even with the shipping lines in attendance, they said the decision is purely economic. So they will make a call based on the type of routing that they have the type of agreements they have with other shipping lines. If they are consolidated to three different shipping lines and there's a particular amount of cargo that needs to move along the coast, either with them coming late out of Europe or going to arrive late into Europe, they will make the call ahead of time. Is there another vessel that actually will be able to pick up this cargo if I drop it at another port in South Africa or alternatively at another port? More so over the shipping lines further indicated that there is more consolidation that's happening on the west coast of Africa. So it makes more economic sense for them to bypass certain ports, to maintain schedule, to be able to move larger volumes in different ports. 
Um, in regard to the Red Sea and why we are not capitalizing, generally these trade routes are set. So vessels that are moving between Asia and Europe have particular cargoes that are set for that. Um, the majority of those ships are very large or ultra large container carriers. Um, so whilst we might be able to, in some of our ports, accommodate the length, we might not be able to accommodate the depth of the vessel in all aspects there too. But the cargo per se on those vessels are destined for a particular port. And generally, the very large and ultra large container carriers, by nature of the size of the vessel and the economies of scale, they come from a hub port in Asia and go to a hub port in Europe. So by virtue of that, there is no other ports generally en route that will find discharge of cargo. And predominantly it goes then into the hub port for total discharge, total turnaround of the cargo, and the vessel then reloads after discharging, and then feeder vessels will move that to the subsequent ports. So the, the Red Sea component itself, um, we won't see a continuous or uh, some benefit out of it because of where the vessels are trading to. However, there are services that we do through our ports that we facilitate in regard to other activities. So for example, where there are crew changes that need to be done, where there are provisions and stores that need to happen, these vessels will then anchor either within our port limits or will anchor in our anchorage area or off port limits and there are then services that are rendered to these vessels, either for crew changes or then for provisions and stores accordingly. Um, I, I will want the port manager maybe just to touch on, are we happy with the eight point plan? Um, we have communicated that that is a co-created plan. So Rajesh, I will leave that one to you. Um, I think in regard to it, um, and then I'll pause, I think, at this point for you to pick up. And if there's anything to add, and then we'll hand over to Oscar. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, um, Captain Jones. Uh, once again, good morning to the colleagues. Uh, Chair, just firstly, on the question about Red Sea as well, just to complement what Captain Jones was sharing, the one positive spin-off that we have seen and that we are, um, that we, are benefiting from is an increase in cruise liner calls. Uh, there's approximately five to six confirmed cruise liner calls that will be diverting across the southern tip of Africa and not going through the Middle East. So that is a benefit. We've seen some of them come through and uh, we are fully appreciative of the economic spin-offs of those. Then to the question uh, regarding the eight point plan. Uh, Chairperson and honorable members, uh, as recent as three weeks ago, we convened our quarterly session, uh, which uh, comprises of a cross section of all the relevant members within the logistic chain. It also includes other um, entities uh, as well as uh, the city officials, the city of Cape Town, as well as the Western Cape government. In that session, we presented the eight point plan. And we posed uh, the question, the eight point plan seemingly has not delivered the desired results at the time we wanted. Was it flawed? I think the unanimous feedback from all members present at that setting was that the eight point plan is sound. The only thing that we need to do is that we need to accelerate implementation of the plan. So we are very comfortable with the eight point plan and i guess it's founded on the fact that it's a co-created identification of challenges as well as solutions to those challenges but ask the simple question are we happy with the plan uh, chair we are happy with the plan we need to accelerate uh, the implementation and thus the call for action across the board within transnet thank you Um, there's a host of questions then. Thank you very much to your chair and honorable members. I'll 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 start from the from from the top. And I, I'd really like to refer to the statement of balance sheet. Now we can we can sit in the corner and say we don't have money. We don't have money. But there's other mechanism that we are deploying. 
Number one is leasing of equipment. Uh, full maintenance lease over a period while we await new equipment. Case in point. Number one is the rubber tied gantries that's been ordered. What do we do in the meantime? The meantime is the second hand that's in place. We have now redundancy in the RTG, and that's a focus to make those pieces of equipment reliable over the next 17 months. And that we will do. We are co-opting Transnet Engineering to help us, taking one machine out at a time, fix gearbox, wiring, all that, and bring it back into the system. So that is the plan. On the cranes, um, that is where we, we find um, more breakdowns. So, and that ties in what you have asked, why are we not performing? So it is um, the cranes, it is the processes and skilled people into the fold. So from that basis, now we're saying, what are we doing about that? And I'm, and, and I'm pleased to say that there's a rally of, of people, external, private participation to help us with that. On the cranes, as I said, we have the manufacturer on site. We're getting more of those skills in. We have engaged, uh, concluded the seven year um, parts contract that we now can just access parts and do that. We've accelerated the number of artisans coming in up to now 17. We're still expecting nine coming in in March. So what we are saying, we can't buy a crane because lead time is another 12 months. But we can't sit because we are impacting the flow of goods, imports and exports. So it gives you a crunch of where we are. Although it's always in place, we have the interventions right now. And that is where we start seeing efficiencies coming through. On the impact of the fruit season, there was about 5,000 uh, containers being diverted to Port Elizabeth and, and Durban. And that was a call from the fruit exporters because they were very concerned that their, their product will not reach end destination. Um, and that was for a time period. What we are seeing now is that they are committed to Cape Town. We're, and hence I said in my previous statement, we are working together to say what is the best, when to bring in the cargo in, when is the vessel coming in, when do we open stacks, when do we engage shipping lines, what is a bet, night run, 24 hours, using Balcon to, to that effect. Unfortunately, that is what we had to resort to, to make it happen for the latter part of the deciduous. I'm happy that it is getting better. So that's the um, that's intervention. On waiting time, it's purely dependent upon our productivity on the key side. And hence, coming back to say we need to improve the throughput, getting the number of containers onto a vessel and off a vessel. I acknowledge that the low productivity was there. However, when we look at the last three weeks, there is a great improvement in that. And that's our real push to get that done and get the systems organized to do just that. Now, why the targets are not met, um, I want to repeat is equipment. It was um, inefficiencies in terms of the system and not connecting the dots, if you might call it, engaging uh, shipping lines, engaging importers, exporters. That has since improved so that we collaborate with that, having the intel having the information at hand to make better decisions. On the targets, the vessel turnaround targets, these are the targets engaged with shipping lines, with our customers to see um, how can we turn the vessel around faster. As Werner has said, there's no dead time, there's wind. There's ranging something of the past. Thank you for TNPA to bring in the short tensioners so we can see that delay being reduced. 
there's no there's no um everything is in there in terms of waiting time there might be issues with um, customs etc i'm not going to dwell in that but the external factors it's included and as i said before there's wind but we can't sit and say because of wind i don't even want to mention wind i want to mention what we are doing for the throughput to get our containers on and off the vessel and that's what we're targeting Yes, we haven't achieved our target. Our drive now is to reduce that downtime, the number of hours so that we can reach the, the 40 hours. I must be also honest, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. What we are saying is, is measure us on the continuous improvement and help us even with that so that we can bring confidence into, into the fold. Um, with regarding the... Um, the wind delays and it has it, it had an impact unfortunately we're sitting with peak season of fruit and with high winds and that has an impact what is the solution and there's uh, thanks glenn for your wind study and etc we'll engage more on that and and with tnpa to work around that and to see that but the ultimate is to say bring in capacity bring in more another game uh, get the equipment up um, work smarter and work with the parties involved, engage, because they know information that we don't have and vice versa. Uh, and I believe that is uh, in terms of the partnership pattern that we have forged and we'll, we'll improve on that partnership. Um, and what I also want to say in terms of your trucks on the road, we had experts from our team Navis, um, up to yesterday, we had a first glance at what's going wrong with our truck system. I will share it with the committees at hand and some interesting factors had evolved from, from that particular study. And I believe we can pull those levers to improve the truck flow through the system. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited to share it with you, Glenn, so that we can see how we can move. And the bottom line is ill discipline is bad management of the system, of there's bad behavior. But we'll highlight that and engage the certain parties who's contributing to that flow. But, um, and I'm, I would be excited to share that at the next engagement, because I believe there's a lot of information and we work together and we can actually improve your truck flow through the system. I hope I've answered uh, the relevant uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are excited to hear more about that when possible. Um, members, are there any further questions for Transnet? Chairperson, apologies. I think there is still one from my uh, TFR colleague from SMA just regarding the security measures. Okay. I think that we're needing to address at Transnet. Um, TFR, if we can hand over to you and then will members go on to your next round of questions. Okay, so on the security side, um, as I indicated, the, the outcome-based security that has been implemented, um, they've yielded quite positive results uh, on the Western Cape. And uh, we've actually managed uh, to also have um, convictions and arrests, um, which is something that we never used to have. And it then uh, has also assisted us to be able to reinstate um, the overhead um, between uh, Belleville and Vosta. We are still currently reinstating uh, between Vosta and um, Salba. There is uh, work that is being done that we foresee that by April it should be completed. So there is work that is being done and there's some intelligence as well that the guys have brought into um, the area to assist us uh, to get uh, this issue of the cable theft uh, to, 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 to be mitigated. But it is still work in progress. We have not yet um, um, got into a stage where we are say we are 100 percent satisfied. There is continuous uh, engagements that we are having with the service provider and also amendments to um, whatever deployments that they have, um, including the technology that they are putting uh, on the line to assist. So, yeah, uh, that is where we are in terms of the security issues. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Members, um, I would just like to get an indication from you. We have approximately three minutes left um, for question and answers for Transnet. And so perhaps what we could do is we could um, send our questions as resolutions to Transnet and ask them to reply. Uh, but members, let me get an indication from you. Um, oh, that's fine, sir. Fine, sir. It's fine. Okay. okay. Can I ask my question now and I can still add, I will take one question, I can still add one other ones because I need the answer from Transnet in this meeting. Okay, let's do one last burning question for each person. Uh, we'll start with you. Thank you. My, my, my question I think is on the PSPs. I just want to understand particularly with the um, uh, collaborative work that uh, Transnet has been doing with the stakeholders, including the Western Cape, what would be the, um, the number or percentage of private sector participation that would have been um, uh, added as a result of this stakeholder engagement? You know, we can give me a percentage, um, including the amount invested. I hear that the, I think on the birthing, I think one colleague was saying there's an RFP that is out. I'm just interested in that because I think this is one also area that for me is very important in understanding that where there are shortfalls both of the balance sheet which we know you know and are not going away any 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 time soon in terms of the national fiscals if in indeed because sometimes it's presented as if there's no private sector participation or it is not being brought on board or there are problems uh, in that regard but i just want to understand during this particular period where you are trying to bring you know the um, industry uh, uh, provincial government has there been any PSPs brought on board? What percentage and what how much investment? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Last burning question, Member van der Vestesen. Yes, thank you, Chair. And, and I was hoping we would have more time for questions. Uh, just a slightly different one. Uh, the Road to, uh, uh, road to Rail initiative. I often uh, need to travel along the N7 and I do note a lot of trucks transporting ore, it seems to me it may be zinc ore, from the Northern Cape down to the Western Cape to our ports. Uh, I used to, or I, I happened to spend uh, a day in Bitterfontein some three, four years ago. And there's, uh, I, was, I was quite surprised by the amount of infrastructure uh, in Bitterfontein, which previously I think it was uh, uh, for the export of granite or marble or something like that. So to what extent can we look forward to perhaps some of the uh, current heavy trucks transporting ore from the Northern Cape to be transferred onto the railway line, even if, if it's halfway, you know, in a, in a place like Bitterfontein, to, to try and uh, alleviate the congestion and particularly the wear and tear on the on the N7 and also other roads because some of them take some back roads towards the port of, of Saldana, please. Thank you very much. Um, I see no further hands. So my uh, last, last, last burning question, um, essentially um, it's with regards to bypassing again. So I want to understand um, why would it not be economical for a shipping line to use Cape Town? Why would it be more economical for them to use another line? This was the argument used for the most recent um, reason for bypassing. Um, do factors like infrastructure, personnel, um, or turnaround time impact on how economical Cape Town is as opposed to other ports? Um, and also, similarly, who are we losing out to? Who are these other ports that are seemingly more economical than us? Um, and I ask this in light of the information that was shared by the department earlier, which spoke to how in 2011 we um, had received a lot more births, but within the recent years we've seen quite a significant decline so where are these boats going instead of us thank you with that i'll hand back to transnet we'll wrap up these questions and then we'll move on thank you thanks um 
chairperson and to the honourable members. Um, I think there's, there was quite a few um, regarding the private sector and I think the percentage of investment. Um, can I request through you, chairperson, that we do take away that question? Uh, because it does require, I think, some information to be consolidated at transnet level. Um, and more so, over, um, I think at the more recent engagement undertaken through the provincial minister's office last week, um, I think our chairperson and our acting group chief executive spoke a little bit around the privatization, PSP, and I think percentages. Um, so if, if we can, that we rather take that question and we will respond formally as Transnet, I think, just to ensure that whatever numbers we are quoted is actually then validated and correct. Um, I think the the one around the road and rail, um, SMA will ask you to come in, uh, but I might just want to pick up because I'm not sure if that um, for Honourable Van Verstaisen, um, if we were specifically talking for the Port of Cape Town, cargoes that are destined by road into Cape Town, or is that just a general statement for the N7 and then linking to the latter comment for Saldana. So just to, if, if it is that it's the latter um, for Saldana, there are, and Small will also be able to possibly just comment, um, specific capacity on the rail that is available for both iron ore and manganese that comes out of Northern Cape. Um, and that is the import leg and then the evacuation thereof through the port of Saldana. Um, there are, emerging miners that do move cargo by road, but our major miners do move it by rail. Um, there is also different agreements that some of the emerging miners have, and that's outside of the ambit of TNPA and TPT in this case, in that the back of port operators is where they are storing cargo. So what is not part of the, the contracted volumes moving through a transnet consolidated transnet rail solution um, then it comes by truck um, is then going to a back of port operator and that then gets fed um, those are generally smaller quantities um, and i do note i think the concern um, in regard to the honorable member um, and i'm sure smart just from a tfr would, would be able to elaborate a bit more um, however, my understanding is also that the N7 in some way or form was upgraded quite a few years ago to assist with heavy oil traffic and hence the double lanes in some of the areas as well. But we do note, I think, the, the concern on the additional wear and tear um, that that actually poses. Um, I'm sure Rajesh, you would be able to come in as well. Um, but on the issue of the shipping lines bypassing, um, are we losing cargo as South Africa? No. So if a cargo is not discharged or loaded in the port of Cape Town, let me use the discharge leg first for cargoes that might be coming into South Africa and destined into Cape Town, they will still get offloaded in another port. At times they are road railed, but there are also feeder vessels that will then pick up the cargo again and come at a later stage into the port of Cape Town, still via either the container terminal or if it's on a, on a smaller vessel, either through the MPT facility that TPT operates, or then through the FPT facility. So not all cargo is lost to the Port of Cape Town from a shipping perspective. The cargo still has a destination and will find itself back to destination just by another mode of transport. Um, in regard to why they would do it, so I think my, my clarification to you, Chairperson, and when you were raising it was, the economies of scale is now not talking to the cargo that is destined for Cape Town. It is in general in terms of them making an economic call. If I am to wait at the port of Cape Town because the, the port is windbound and we have weather problems for the next two days, by the time we arrive to the port, how does that impact my next schedule at the next port and onward to the final destination? And I think those are the, the calculated risks that the shipping line would make over and above that, if they are on a consortium type agreement, there are other vessels on the coast that they will generally bypass that too. So it's not a South African phenomenon. It is not a Port of Cape Town phenomenon. It happens all over the world. If vessels are out of schedule, they will make the call to bypass and say we are loading cargo onto the next available vessel. And they will actually 
what is referred to possibly deleting that particular voyage and the calls that are associated with just to bring a vessel back on rotation. And it even happens at times that they would could bypass if they are swapping out vessels because they might be changing certain vessels either from a smaller one to a larger or larger to smaller. And that also has an impact. Um, I think, Rajesh, I'm not sure if you're wanting to to add before we hand over to TFR, but uh, Chairperson, there was something that just spurred me, I think, in regard to the turnaround time earlier as well. We should also note that the whilst the vessel numbers have decreased, the cargo parcel sizes have increased, meaning that there's more consolidation of cargo per vessel. So whilst we might have operated more vessel calls into the Port of Cape Town previously, the vessels have decreased, but the cargo is remaining fairly constant. But the, the, the consolidation of that per vessel is larger. Thanks, Rajesh. I'm not sure if there's anything. Thanks, uh, Captain Jones, for the opportunity. So just to emphasize the, the points that Captain Jones makes and just to add one or two, uh, the economic impacts and the economic considerations as we understand it to be that the shipping lines undertake. We need to look at the evolution of uh, logistic transport. I think with the advent of COVID first and foremost, you know, there was a more a more detailed requirement from for door to door services as opposed to bulk servicing. OK, so that fundamentally shifted in terms of uh, cargo uh, logistics. It also contributed to three phenomena as we see it. The first one Captain Jones covered was that you're seeing the rationalization of vessels on a route. So you're finding smaller vessels, or not smaller, bigger vessels on a route, but uh, fewer vessels. You then finding, secondly, the consolidation of cargo on, on board a vessel. So whereas before you had more smaller vessels, now you're having bigger, fewer vessels. And then thirdly, you have this phenomena of very complex co-sharing and co-loading agreements between different uh, ship lines, uh, which is also uh, very, very complex uh, and confidential to a great degree. With regards to uh, the movement of cargo, Captain Jones is absolutely right. We attract our hinterland cargo, it will find its way here. Okay. Uh, case in point, uh, one of the shipping lines recently, because of this uh, reconfiguration of, of routes, have introduced and induced a specific line of call between um, the port of Kuha and the port of Cape Town. So they can interchange where they would want to uh, land first or leave last into Europe. So that's the sort of uh, intelligence that the shipping line uses to ensure that the cargo eventually lands up where it's supposed to. Thanks, Chippers. Ms. Smart, would you like to come in on the final question? And good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Shandine. I'm the head of the the Cape Corridor. Um, I'm sitting with Smart. Um, so I just wanted to respond to one or two of the elements that were raised, and I think Vernal covered us in terms of the volumes, uh, the road volumes that's running on the N7. But from the, on the iron ore line, that section of, of volumes that goes from the Northern Cape to the ore line, that is a uh, line is running in capacity. And what Vernal has correctly stated is that typically um, the emerging miners would utilize road transport um, where there is not sufficient capacity. Might I add that over time, that in the past few years, and um, that we each year we've been increasing the allocation of capacity on the rail side that we have made um, to emerging miners, and we have been accommodating um, many more. I think it, on the all line um, itself, but we added two or three additional. Uh, on the emerging miners in terms of um, offering capacity to them that which they've taken up. Unfortunately, we cannot service all of their demands or the requirements because there is a contracting process with a whole lot of role players. But um, in the absence of the short-term uh, capacity constraint, we are looking at a, a much broader expansion program 
um, together, together with the ports and on the rail side and on the Saldana portion. And we will look at um, we, we will look at increasing capacity significantly, um, where we should be in future able to accommodate a whole lot more of um, the emerging minor requirements. Um, that's it on, on um, covering um, that portion. On the PSPs also, um, we will work together with in terms of coordinating the, the percentage of PSP spent uh, to date, given the um, ongoing engagements and, and consultations and stakeholder alignment with regards to um, PSPs. So we will add our bit, um, transit controls bit to that uh, particular response. And then just on, in terms of um, also PSP opportunities where we have been looking at um, concessions and branch line concessions. I know the very most recent one, if I can call it that, would have been the Algin one that we, um, I mean, it's top of mind for everybody and it's, it's a very familiar one. Um, unfortunately, at the time that we advertised that one, because that for that we also we were also looking at PSP participation and getting industry involved private sector involved in investing in, in the terminal in the terminal in, in Alden. So um, that one we didn't get um, we didn't have any interest in that particular RFP, but um, it is open for um, advertising again. Um, so we will be looking into that one um, because typically a lot of these branch line concessions are driven from a requirement perspective where um, private partners would approach us and say they've got this kind of proposal. Um, and unfortunately, we're like such, and we are a bit reluctant to take to market again, and uh, not knowing that um, what the appetite is at the moment. Again, there's ongoing engagement with the relevant municipalities in the Western Cape to assess, um, you know, the appetite for these kinds of things, um, so that we are able to put it out in the market at some point um, shortly in the future. I'm hoping we've covered all of the um, questions. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, I think if there are any online, I mean, any following questions that haven't been addressed, um, as we've resolved, we'll send these through to you as part of our own resolutions. Um, so with that, I just want to, uh, yes, this one's called quick. Thank you, Jeff. If you don't mind, we've just got one addition to make. Um, I just want to add, and then I'll just hand over to Glenn. I think specifically with uh, two things, we've got about five to six weeks left in our table grape season. And I think that's, it's very, um, positive to see, especially what Oscar is doing in terms of TPT, that we're seeing slight improvements. But critically, and that's where the partnership and conversation is, mm. with G4J, we want to triple exports, and that's going to place even more pressure on, on our ports, um, especially with regards to managing this addition. We talk, we talk at triple exports, about 80% of that will be goods. Um, in addition, the, the impact that the port has is not just the movement of exports, but also in terms of imports. That's just as just as important with regards to what that does, especially for our, our manufacturing sectors in terms of any delays caused. And that's where uh, we've had lots of engagements in the last, I don't know, three years, but specifically over the last two weeks with um, especially the role that uh, Port of Durban plays in, in that regard. So it's all different commodities working. And it is important to mention that there's, we, we need to maintain and preserve, and I think it, that's a shared agreement um, across the board from all the stakeholders. We had that massive port stakeholder dialogue last week, and it was agreed that um, these are shared shared priorities, especially because there is competition on the continent with regards to, um, in particular, um, container terminals that are, that if they're not already, that they are, they will propose, uh, pose a threat with regards to how we position South Africa from a logistics chain perspective. And competition is good. And I think that's where, where Transit is striving to say we need to be globally competitive, whether it's through our targets, whether it's through performance indicators, um, but the, the world works in that manner and business goes where you're going to get the best business. Um, so that's quite key to mention. Um, I just want to hand over to Glenn. He just got one or two issues to raise as well. Thank you. Chair, is there another minute? I just thought it would be useful to give uh, a port user perspective on that rich, those rich responses that Transnet gave to the questions. And it seems to me that all the questions from Member Nkondlo about what the Premier said about targets, 
uh, a member for Navestasen's questions, your questions, even the last question about the Transnet eight point plan. All those questions are in fact related and the response to them are all kind of interconnected. And I, and I, and I think that the dichotomy that uh, Oscar gave to us of splitting this particular deciduous export season in two, the, the first half and the second half was incredibly helpful. So that we had the sense that uh, certain targets were not met that were agreed, agreed upon <clears throat> equipment being available um, at the end of November because the, the season starts roughly one December. So because the that equipment, and we spoke it about it, the, the refurbishment of the RTGs and the bringing of the other seven from Los Angeles, because those were not in place in one November as the target was expected, the first half of the season was a bit of a disaster. And uh, and and what made the, the disaster more painful is the previous three seasons were also not good and the exporters were hit with quality penalties um, and vessels bypassed. So all those questions you asked were relevant to the first half. And then um, there were changes, and then the refurbished RTGs came into operation. The, the Los Angeles RTGs arrived, they were made operational. So you see from about the second week of January, so let's then say um, uh, half of halfway through January into now the second half of the season, we're seeing a totally different picture. And that's what I mentioned about we're holding our breath because we are seeing that we've turned and, and the recovery is in place. So please God and please everyone working on it, before we get to end March, we are going to see uh, the cargo moving. We are going to see vessels um, berthing on arrival. So the decision, just to come to your point about whether a vessel calls or not, is halfway Half of it is international considerations, and the other half is how efficient is that port? And the decision is made based on both of those. Um, so we are cautiously optimistic that all these variables are going to change in our favor um, as we move to March, and being mindful that as soon as the last grapes go out, that's when we start moving apples and pears. And then we have a short delay before the citrus comes. So if all goes well, Chair, we're going to end the deciduous season well, and we're going to start our citrus season well. I thought I just wrap up into Mr. Van der Westen's point. So we cannot use one KPI in this isolation. We cannot just talk about ship working hours. We cannot just talk about cargo volumes. We have to look at both of them in context, and a vessel from the Suez Canal, who's now rushing to get to his destination, has to take 10 days longer because he has to come around the Horn of Africa, doesn't want to stop anywhere. He's already lost 10 days. He wants to get to his destination. So that's not the market we are hoping for. If they're desperate, we might give them some fuel, but the sooner they get to their market, the better. So we will want to isolate the markets that we want to compete for and make sure we attract them. Thank you, Beth. Thank you very much. I think that was a very helpful summary and a nice way to tie it up. Um, puts everything into context today from what we've heard. I know that we've gone quite over time in terms of this allotted area. So I just want to say very much thank you to Transnet, to all the teams who've joined us today, to the Port Authority um, and to those online. We do have our next presentation, which you're welcome to stay for, but if you can't, we completely understand, please do at least help yourself to coffee, snacks, we have overcated. Um, in that case, can I just check if um, Terry Gale, uh, the chairman for the Exporters Western Cape is online? Yes, I am, Che. Okay, great. Um, hi, Terry, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm getting, this is my first 
doing it like this. I'm going to try to share my screen, but I'd just like to first of all say thank you for this opportunity and uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to say um, all protocol reserved for the minister, the D director general, all the colleagues in the room. And uh, it's coming up after such incredible presentations from Transnet as well. And I think we are certainly can see from my side, we can see massive, massive changes. So just bear with me. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Okay, no problem. We'll give you a moment to get set up um, so long. And I think maybe we can try and start by 10 past. Everyone happy? Or the second you're ready, I think we can start as well. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect, Terry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm using, I'm using, just, just for those who are not aware, this is the information that we get every week from the ports. So just, just as a starter, we're ending up with what the deciduous fruit and the fruit season has been doing. Just so you can get an indication, this is the importance of the information that we receive every single week, every Wednesday morning, when all the stakeholders actually meet online and this is and this has been going on since COVID since uh, June 2020 so it's a vital vital leg and it's incredible to see now we can see changes we can see developments taking place as well and that's exactly what it's all about um, so this is just gives you what the weekly move this I'm um, starting with the main container terminal you can see the figures that we moved for last week this is a week the 12th to the 18th of February because we're always a week behind and it gives you your your gross container moves per hour your ship working our moves per ship working hour which is what has been under question as well we at 26 at the moment which has certainly improved however we want we need to start moving that gauge into the green. Um, because this is, we need to go get into global best practice for this. We need to increase our productivity because once we increase our productivity, everything starts moving a lot quicker. We don't have these vessels bypassing Cape Town. We need to make the port of Cape Town welcome to all to everybody. Just before before I actually forgot in my introduction, I just wanted to make a comment as well that looking at the stakeholders online this morning, uh, I'm very happy to see that the largest container operator shipping line in the world, the executive team are on board. So that actually says quite a lot because we always try at these weekly meetings to actually get the stakeholders, the shipping lines in particular, because we have to work in cooperation and collaboration. That is the name of the game. And we can only, we need each other. We need TFR, we need TPT, we need TNPA, and we need the lines on board the transporters. Once we get all that together and realize we actually have the same goal and the same vision, it'll go a lot better. And I believe we certainly are on the right road as well. So thank you to our colleagues from the world's biggest shipping line. Thank you for being on board as well. Okay, I'm going to now move to the next slide, sorry. But there's a there's a water side as you can see our tar we just under target sixteen thousand we reach fifteen nine eight seven. This is just gives you as I said your truck gauge moves your staging and your truck visits per shift. As you can see the morning shifts team the morning and the afternoon shifts and this is what we talk about as well that we want to increase the night shifts it's at thirteen percent. And as I think we've alluded to earlier, Transnet have alluded to, it's a 24-7 hour port. I know in the windy season, unfortunately, the wind is at, at night is the worst. However, we are busy marketing that as well to make sure that people can go or industry can understand that that is when it's an easier traffic flow or truck flow into the terminals as well. Um, we, it's just so that you can get an idea. This is all the truck gate moves. The truck per shift. So just so you can get an idea of what happens there. Um, this is the stack occupancy, 37%. Rail moves, the rail moves from Belcom, 345, which is obviously we're going to look at a great improvement there, in particular with now Belcom coming more on stream. Again, we need to we can do a target up to 1500 because we still say besides being eco-friendly, it's actually a fact that we can use Belcom 24/7 and it's not going to have and the impact that the wind has, in particular with our fruit, we're looking at some of our general cargo exporters to move into the Belcon route as well. 
dropping of containers at Belcon and then get railed from there prior to term stack opening. And then from there, they get moved across to, to the terminals. OK, thank you. Now we go on to the, thank you for that. Um, the CT, the Cape Town multipurpose terminal. Um, here we're reaching, as you can see, our target. We actually got last week, we had a target of three, 2388 with 2340 actual. So we're very, very close to target. However, the ship working hours and the container moves per hour is very slow. This one of the reasons being, obviously, because the terminal is, does not have the landside equipment and most of it has to be ship, ship's gear. And the landside equipment we've had major, major problems with. Now, one of the points I'm going to bring out here is, is the importance of the multipurpose terminals and the work, the work that we're doing at the moment. Because multipurpose terminals, the American vessels generally called at this terminal. They're the smaller vessels, they have their own equipment. However, we have had major, major delays. I can't recall the name of the vessel, but there was one vessel that was stuck at the MPT for 17 days. Now that actually we cannot, cannot afford that. The American, as everybody knows, one of it's my passions when it comes to the trade, because it's one of our best trades and it's one of the most growing trades. American economy is still booming and we can grow into that economy with a go, and I'm sure a go will be continued. We're fighting for that as well. However, I can see, and I'm not just talking fruit here as well, I'm talking general cargo. They are wanting, wanting our business. They want to deal with us. And you take this rate of exchange is very much in our favor to move cargo. And what our big thing was previously, that the multipurpose terminal, the vessels calling there, two on the state's trade lane, where every vessel guaranteed a vessel, one vessel per week. And that's what we sold to a lot of our American companies that we are buying from us. And that's what they liked. Direct Cape Town, New York, New York, New York, 8, 14, 18 days transit time. And they, it was like clockwork. It really, really worked like clockwork. Every single week we had, and because of the volumes, they're much smaller vessels, so the capacity is a lot limited, and that worked well. Now we actually, and we're sitting in a position at the moment, and our exporters are actually crying. I've addressed this with two the two carriers that operate on this berth. Our exporters are crying. They're getting new contracts in uh, to the U.S. They can't deliver because vessels are full. The vessels are now full until the end of March. That is unacceptable. And it's not, yes, it's not just fruit. We're talking manufactured goods. Manufactured goods is part of our G4J, growth for jobs. Manufacturers actually create employment. And I know I can talk to our minister here as well, and I can also talk to the port manager, because they both have, have visited the company in Atlantis that is growing exponentially. And they're actually, in fact, they're visiting the States from tomorrow. There's going to be major, major growth in that market. However, if we can't ship the containers, we're going to lose out. We're going to looking at 1,700 jobs that would be at stake if we cannot get the sorted out. We need to get that multi-purpose terminal up and running as it should be. Alternatively, I know they have been using, sometimes they go into the main terminal as well to load containers, but I think this is, we have to, we have to collaborate and cooperate on that one. The stack occupancy, just to complete, is 19% and giving you a stack utilization. Um, yes, it's all self-explanatory, truck turnaround time, trucks, everything. This is, as I say, just to explain to you, looking at what's happened, our main three terminals, the FPT, which is a privately run terminal, it's very much for the fruit industry as well. However, they do do a lot of multi-cargo multi vessels, um, very, they have very good figures for the past week as well. You can see they handle 2,571 containers. The break bulk, and you can see that we're looking at 6,000, nearly 7,000 pallets of fruit. And looking at the forecast, very good as well. So it just gives you an indication. This is what we get every week from them. And this gives you an indication, actually, of what is moving and what can move via the multipurpose. It's also a multipurpose terminal in a way, but in fact, it's more trip gear than anything else. Um, so that just gives you an indication. As I say, if anybody needs these presentations, you're more than well. This is the one that I think we're all going to want to focus on as well. The deciduous season, this is from last week. And 
I can actually say, you can see there's your line there. You can see the different uh, fruits that are moved. And I think the table grapes is the big one we're talking about as well. And I must say thank you, Oscar, for your input there as well. And the table grapes this week, or shall we say for last week, the figures are certainly improving. And the, the turnaround time is looking a lot better than it was a few weeks ago. And a lot of lot of this has been our friends in Kukha uh, have actually helped us a lot there. We've had this year four SAIX vessels and what, two MEC calling at Kukha, picking up fruit for us, picking up our grapes, which is exactly what we need. Because grapes, if I'm not mistaken, from, from Packhouse, to delivery is maximum 40 days for quality. Otherwise, it gets to the other side. You might not, you might not even bother to ship it out. So it's vitally, vitally important the time frame for that as well. It's good to see. I think the figures are increasing and the movement is a lot better as well. As you can see, also we have been moving. As you can see, the mauve there is table grass, which we don't like to see, is from Namibia. Um, those are the grapes that come, obviously come from Northern Cape that move across to Walfus Bay. Walfus Bay is unfortunately a bit of a competition for us. Walfus Bay markets itself incredibly well. Um, I have to say, visiting there last year, um, I don't know why, don't quote me. Um, however, uh, they market themselves, and this, a lot of it is, as I always say to my friends at TNPAs, we need to market our port. We must market ourselves because we are improving. We have one of the best, I mean, the most beautiful situated ports in the world, and thanks to that, because that's why we have the wind as well. However, we will get over this, and it's just incredible to see the difference this is actually now taking. That's all the past for export impact. That shipments for all markets as well. As I said, if you want to, you want to me to share this with you so you can get a better understanding. Um, it's actually is very informative as well. And as I said, the good thing is this is Cape Town actual containers. You can see in week seven, we actually moved 2,076. In week seven, in week in last year we did 2219. So and in the year before 2053. And you can see week six, we did 2665, which is fantastic compared to what we've done the previous years. So you're looking for the last three weeks, our figures have gone up. And I think we also, when there was a, quite a lot in the press about the Santa Rita that left Cape Town, if I'm not mistaken, about 1,720 TUs on board, which was a record for the Port of Cape Town. So I think that's actually incredibly, incredibly positive for us as well, that we're in an up tree, up, upward trajectory as well. So that's really, really good. This is your Durban containers. Sorry. There you go. That's your containers from Durban, which, as I think Oscar alluded to as well, it's all coming from Cape. It's all for South Africa. It's not going to other ports or anything like this. So South Africa as a brand is not losing anything. You can see a lot of grapes moving. Durban held up as well. So this is why we're getting the grapes moving. We're not holding back. So this is the good thing. And I think also looking at the coming citrus season, I know a lot of vessels, uh, one of the big carriers is putting vessels direct into Port Elizabeth to, so that they can carry the oranges and the citrus that comes from the Sundays River Valley. So that's also going to help and have a big impact because the oranges from the Cape or the citrus from the Cape comes mainly from Clang William. Um, so it's also a good thing as well that we are working together. This is pea and knocker containers. As I mentioned too, we had quite a lot of oranges, table grapes, sorry, table grapes, as you can see the figures there, that they helped us a lot in this last season. So again, we get to the point that we actually are working together, which is really, really quite fantastic to see. Also, over the last week as well, we actually have had more favorable weather. So I think just from that side, it's actually gone. It's really, I think that the system has gone very well. And I've just just a few little comments from my side is, um, and this is from, and I didn't get a chance to mention this at our engagement last Tuesday, but I do believe we have the dream team on board now. We have two advocates and two lady advocates in charge. We, and we must, our advocate Phyllis DeFetu and advocate Mich Michelle Phillips, we need to ensure 
that they actually are not acting executives. They must become permanent staff, exactly the same as Oscar. We know Oscar well. Oscar has been fantastic. And as you can see, the information he shares, he comes with a credible pedigree. We need these people to actually be full-time employed in these positions. We don't want acting. If you work for a company and your MD is acting, are you going to be motivated to work? No, you're not. Well, you are in a way, but you don't know because your current MD will give you one decision tomorrow, the next that decision is taken away. So I think from that point of view, we need to look at it. There are golden, golden opportunities. And as I've said, from another point of view is what's happening in Kulemborg. That really, really can be a game changer. We're looking at public-private partnership there. This is one of the things I'm certainly going to, and I'm certainly going to be marketing the Port of Cape Town when I address the Africa, uh, invest in Africa Summit in The Hague in April. I think without further ado, that's just generally my comments as well. Um, I do appreciate the time that I've taken here as well. It's been a very brief discussion, but I hope I've added a little bit of value. And if there are any questions, please let me know. Terry, thank you very much um, for the presentation. We really do appreciate it, and it will go a long way in helping us with the report that we aim putting together, as well as the recommendations um, which we'll send to the National Minister. Um, members, if you could please raise your hand to indicate if you have any questions for Terry. Uh, the first hand I see is Member van der Westhuizen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that presentation. And it's wonderful to see and hear that we've got alternatives when uh, the city or the port of Cape Town is congested. But still, the point that I would like to make, and, and uh, perhaps you can just give me an idea of, of cost, uh, for citrus from Citrus Dull to the Cape Town port, uh, it, it seems just the logical nearest point uh, because obviously every handling of, of uh, fruit brings about not only the transport costs, but also, you know, time spent on, on, on trucks uh, is also uh, impacting on the quality of the end product uh, and obviously the price that the producer would be would be getting. And the same with the, with the, the table grapes, I think uh, probably from the, the the, the Harip River, uh, Uppington area, as well as table grapes from the Cape Winelands area and table grapes from the, the Durans area. It just seems to me logical that those grapes would uh, choose the Cape Town port as uh, its first or default port. Uh, so, so perhaps if you could just expand a little bit on on the, the costs associated with transporting grapes then from here or even from uh, Uppington to Durban, rather than 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 to Cape Town, uh, or then you know going to Kaberga or, or Kuga for for other uh, uh, you know agricultural products. What do you deem to be the the additional costs that uh, producers need to incur if the Cape Town port is not able to uh, get that onto a ship straight away? Thank you. Uh, sorry, should I take that question now? Terry, you are more than welcome to respond. Okay, yes, thank, thank you. Very interesting question, and I wish I could give you the answer straight away. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my email address in the chat, chat room, and if you won't just, if you don't mind just sending me an email, and then I will be able to answer because it's going to take a little bit of homework. I have to, I don't have those figures offhand, but I will certainly respond to you. Uh, if you just send me an email and I'll respond to you with, with pleasure. I'd just like to offer an opportunity <laughs> for another answer. Uh, thanks, thanks, Madam Chair, uh, honorable members, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Just to answer that question, the direct cost of moving a container from Cape Town to Quebecha or Port Elizabeth is 38,000. Thank you for having that number on hand and anticipating the question. Um, are there any further questions, members? All right. 
With that, um, Terry, I would like to sincerely thank you for your submission and your contribution. You're welcome to stay on for the duration of the call and um, we'll move on to our next presenter. Okay, our next presenter is the South African Association of Ship Operators and Agents. Um, can I just check if Indra bears online? I am, yes, I am. Hi, Ian. Um, you're welcome to pull up your presentation and begin when you're ready. Am I visible at the moment? Yes, uh, you just need to put it on slideshow mode. Oh, so Daisy, sorry. My mouse doesn't want a mouse, but I'll do that now. So I've been batting with load shedding, so I'm uh, struggling a little bit to get that sorted out here. Yeah. Eben, um, just while you're trying to figure that out, um, if you'd like to speak to it in the meantime, the members do have hard copies, um, at, sorry, and um, soft copies as well. Okay, yeah, well, if I can um, just start talking in the meantime. Um, my name is Eben Joubert. I've been privileged to be working in an agency capacity in the Port of Cape Town for the last um, about 11 years. Uh, before that, um, apart from Mossel Bay, I've worked in all the southern African ports from uh, Mossel, uh, well, from uh, the west coast of Walfus Bay to the east coast of Ritsis Bay. Um, what I want to actually just do today is just to go through um, some of the uh, concerns that we do have. Uh, there we go. Oh, my hat. I'm begging your pardon. I um, We're going to be looking at basically the firstly the productivity. What I want to do is in, in, in Cape Town first. Um, over the last three quarters, our um, average move per hour has been 18. And that's according to the TNPA report that was presented to the PCC um, about a week and a bit ago. What I have then also done, I have um, gone through the figures um, like Terry has like given us from the 18th of December till the 18th of February. And then we only managed a move per hour of about 10.28, um, um, which is quite a bit different. But yeah, things do change. And that is why that it, where it stands at the moment. If we have a look at the global um, figures, and that's figures that's been presented by the um, World Bank. Uh, first for 2021, what they've actually done, they've broken up these um, figures um, according to the size of the vessel. Um, but still, if you look at 2021, um, you get to an average there of about 23.34 containers per hour. And if you just move one further to 2022, um, you actually get an average also very similar of about 23.18 uh, moves per hour. Now, as you can see, our productivity is way below the figures that's been given by the World Bank. And I must just add that these figures are actually calculated on all ports throughout the world. Um, it's not only certain ports. You obviously get ports that handle 60, 70 containers an hour. These guys are just crazy. And then you get people that do maybe about five or six. So these are the averages of uh, what's being handled throughout the world. Um, there has been a lot of concern about um, surcharges that's applicable to South African ports at the moment. Um, specifically, what we're looking at here is a port congestion surcharge. Um, if I can just we just go back a little bit and just try to quantify how this actually come about and, and, and what the reasoning is for that. And 
also what it's costing the shipping lines to actually call ports. Um, if we look at the Clarksea index uh, for 2023, the average container vessel charter rate was about $23,600, whereas in 2022, it was about $37,500. Um, now, that would be equating to about $985 a, an hour, or, well, 2022 was about $1,500 an hour. If we look at our average terminal berthing delays for the last three quarters, as presented by to the PCC a while ago, that was 104 hours. Now, if you look at um, a ship waiting outside for a berth for 104 hours, which is about four and a half, nearly four and a half days, uh, and you start doing your voyage calculation on that specific vessel. Uh, for a start, you, you, you're sitting with a, with a with an amount of about $102,000 um, in the red without even loading or discharging a single container. And in 2022, it was even worse. It was, you're looking at about $161,000 before even touching or moving any container. Um, that is the big reason why the shipping lines has to cover, recover some of this cost, because they are a business after all, um, and everybody needs to make a profit, and they've got shareholders to answer to. And um, given the, the slow productivity rate as well, and then you've got your labor issues as well, where people leave a little bit earlier for tea times, they come back a little bit later, you know, you lose another hour or two during operation, just because of these type of factors, um, that's another couple of thousand dollars down the line. And the shipping lines cannot afford to keep on carrying these type of costs indefinitely. My, our reason that we've found for this low productivity um, relates to both the quantity and quality of the terminal equipment. Most of our equipment is, is, is fairly old, um, fairly poorly maintained at the best of times. And there simply is not enough of it to go around to service both the water side, uh, in other words, the vessel, as well as the land side, uh, be that the trucks that bring the containers in. This also leads to um, trucks that's waiting for hours outside the terminals, just waiting to get the, the, the um, cargo into or out of the container terminal. Uh, we all know that the congestion, which has been touched on by uh, previous presenters as well, and obviously, there's also a cost involved for these transporters as well, because um, in the same way as when a, a vessel does not operate, um, it does cost the transporters money as well um, to have the truck stand. We are very much in favour of a private sector partnership um, between TNPA uh, or Transnet rather and um, the, and the private sector. Um, our only concern at the moment is there seem to be a little bit of um, licensing conditions, which is not conducive to good trade in these private uh, concessions. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, the lease at Aberth is a short term lease. Um, so obviously the, the leasee is not going to spend a lot of money putting cranes, et cetera, or infrastructure in there if they know they're not going to be able to operate that birth over a long term. And then there's also um, a little bit of restrictions about the type of vessels that the certain people can handle. Uh, once that gets removed and there's a free choice where people want to send their vessels to, whether they're geared or whether they're not geared, that'll also alleviate the situation. Um, it looks maybe a little bit gloomy and doomy, but it's not. Uh, we've got to take a hats off to our port manager, uh, Mr. Rajesh Dana. And his team, um, these guys are doing an incredibly difficult job. And sometimes it feels like these guys are doing the job with their hands tied halfway behind their backs. But they are still going above and beyond um, to improve these figures that I've just presented to you. Um, with that, um, I will open myself up to any questions that there might be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibn. I think you've also provided an interesting angle um, to the discussion that we've been having today. Members, do you have any questions with regards to this slide? Hey, I see no hands. Um, I do have two questions myself. Um, I think the, the first thing for me is if you could sort of put it in more layman's terms um, for a politician, 
What would be the metrics you feel um, need to be improved on specifically to, incre um, to increase our gross crane productivity and to avoid port congestion surcharges? And then my second question um, was just, I haven't actually heard this perspective on the leases before um, about the length of them and the remo removal of restrictions. So if you could just elaborate on that a little bit for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, first and foremost, I think um, our biggest uh, problem is that the shortage of equipment. Um, there simply is not enough uh, equipment to service both the trucks that bring the containers in or taking them out or taking cont um, the containers to the vessels itself. So uh, I think somebody mentioned a little bit earlier on, well, they, they saw this minutes past going past between um, a container being loaded on the vessel and the next one arriving. Now that should they be able to 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 uh, gather more or uh, get more equipment? Obviously, that's going to help because the cranes are going to be fed at a, at a much better rate. So the containers will then actually load a lot faster or discharge a lot faster, and your actual port call of the of of the vessel will then be shortened as well. Um, unfortunately, you know this equipment is not something that you can just go to. Uh, a rubber gigantic shop on the corner and go buy some. These are all equipment that is um, being pre-ordered. Most of that stuff is, I think, um, on an average waiting period of about two to three years. So I cannot foresee our situation improving drastically for the next couple of years. Um, obviously, there's going to be rental equipment coming in, and hopefully that will help as well. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a longer term solution to the problem, and it's mostly due to transit for a long while not investing in new equipment in the first place, and in the second place, um, not really uh, maintaining the the equipment that they had in a proper fashion. But that I must admit that has changed. So we are looking forward to the equipment, even the new equipment that came from the states, uh, well the second and the equipment that came from the states. Um, a month or so ago, um, even that has not really made a significant um, impact on our loading rate for for for, for the vessel, um, because you've still got some of the other equipment that's still breaking down, and this equipment is just basically stepping in for it. Um, sorry, if I might just ask your second part of your question that had to do with the. If you could just elaborate in terms of your question on. Um... In terms of your comment on the private sector partnership for long-term leases and removal of restrictions. All right. Um, what I can say is, at the moment, your your lease for a birth um, is on a short-term basis. Now there has been a, a request gone gone out already about the extension of that lease. Apparently there was a bit of a technical hitch with it and it was withdrawn and another one is going out soon according to what Captain um, Vernon has just said a little bit earlier. Uh, if you want to actually effectively run um, a berth like that, you've got to be able to put equipment on, on the key side. Uh, by that I mean things like mobile cranes, um, etc. Um, and if you've only got a short term lease on that, on that um, a specific birth, you are not going to actually invest millions to, to get mobile cranes in and um, just to have your, your cranes like standing idle if somebody else gets at least in, a, in, a, in another year or two. Um, what has also happened is uh, FPD for instance now, they are restricted to the type of vessels that they can handle. They are not allowed to handle uh, gearless vessels. Um, that means vessels that don't have their own cranes uh, and therefore the need for something like a mobile crane to be positioned on that berth. So should that restriction on the on the operating license be removed, uh, obviously then they will be, uh, and they've got a long-term lease, then they will be prepared and they are prepared to invest heavily in infrastructure to make that berth a productive one where you can handle all kinds of vessels, uh, be they geared, um, having their own currents or not, um, that'll help a long way to, to alleviate that problem as well. I hope that helps.
Yes, thank you. It's a very interesting perspective. Um, I do see that there's a hand from Bradley Augustine. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And then and, uh, Bradley, please. Can I start, Madam Chair? Please proceed. Ah, thank you very much um, and good afternoon or good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Javert. Uh, a simple question. Um, you spoke earlier on about the current waiting time of vessels being somewhere in the region of 100, um, 100 hours plus minus four days. So um, what what level of waiting time um, would be required for us to get rid of the surcharge? I, I know you might not be in control of it completely, but in, in, in your opinion, what do we need to strive for? Um, however we do it, um, you know, whether it's through additional equipment or changing processes or whatever it is, but at, at, at least what do we need to do in order to get to that mark? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Before I hand back to Evan, I'd just like to give Oscar an opportunity to come in. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the questions and comments as well. And I think Bradley has touched on the one, because I think it's important to to understand the parameters what we are dealing with. On the on the other part in terms of the efficiency, and I need to really need to add to the comments. Um, for the efficiency to improve, you need the multiple pieces of equipment. You need your crane, you need your rubber tied gantry, and you need your haulers. Uh, from the perspective of 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 the haulers, uh, I admit that the level, the fleet is low, and we've identified that we need to increase. And this will be done. It's only coming in July, June, specifically, an additional forty seven haulers to close the gap from now to then. And that is what we've approved and what we're doing to lease haulers in until such time for six months. That will close the gap and that will then address that particular efficiencies uh, on the starting time and on the operator shift, uh, shift change. I need to address that as well. We've identified that as waste. And you can see an in the, in the improvement in terms of startup times and uh, shift change over that has improved because that's a management supervisory function that's closely monitored on an hour by hour basis. With that being said, as as well with the shift change over, we are embarking on a on a new shift system, uh, what we call a four shift system. Now that will reduce the number of of changeovers. Um, that will also mean that our operators and our staff will have more rest time, less fatigue, and we see that will also improve the efficiency. So the, those are the initiatives in play, and um, I'm looking forward to, to see the results thereof. Thank you. Thank you. Evan, uh, just hold on for one second. I'd just like to give Captain an opportunity to come in, and then we'll go back to you. Thanks, uh, Chairperson. Thanks for the opportunity. Just to add on that, um, so Eben is correct. I did make mention in regard to Aberth, and I think for the members when they do go back to the slide packets on slide number 14, um, and we said that that is in progress, and I did make mention that we will be going out to market again. But I just maybe want to make two points, uh, Chairperson, and emphasize two points. That one, um, I hear Eben talking specifically to one of our terminal operators, and that's FPT. They've been fortunate that they are the successful lessee and the bidder at the time for the short-term lease. When we go out to market, it will be an open and transparent process, and it will be open to everyone. In regard to the comment that was made that FPT is currently constrained to only handle geared vessels, on request, TNPA has approved gearless vessels at Aberth. So maybe we just want to correct the 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 statement that was made that they are constrained. Um, and TNPA has assisted the terminal operator, uh, being FPT, to allow that. So they're able to bring in equipment for a particular vessel. And I think just looking at um, the particular 
um, stow and the the size of the cargo parcel size that must come off the tnpa then makes an assessment and has previously approved that with fpt thanks chairperson thank you very much Ivan. back to you uh, thank you sir uh, firstly with regards to the congestion surcharge um we must just remember that this surcharges are not determined by um, the shipping lines on a local level. That is all determined by the head of us, wherever the, the, the shipping line might be based, be it Geneva, be it wherever it may be. And they don't only just look at, at what happens in South Africa, but they also look at what happens in South Africa and how that influences the rest of, of their port calls uh, throughout the world. They do their voyage calculations. And from there, they actually determine whether they are still within the parameters that they've set um, as far as what average waiting time is concerned and so forth. Um, it's very difficult for me to actually uh, give a proper answer to say um, they must wait for 10 hours or one hour or two hours because I'm not privy to these um, calculations that these guys do. They do it, um, like I say, um, at the head of us for the shipping lines over the, overseas, and we are not privy to those calculations of what um, the criteria they actually use to make uh, make these calculations. Um, Captain Jones, I thank you for, for correctifying the situation about um, FPT. Well, I can just say that in a week and a half ago in the uh, weekly stakeholders engagement meeting, um, that was also the statement that I made was also a statement that was made by FPT terminal manager. Um, what I understand now is that the concession is being handled on a case-to-case -case basis, which should not be the case. That should be an open, open, um, ended lease agreement. They can handle any vessel, and you don't need to sort of like renegotiate the terms of your of your license um, as far as what um, what you can handle and what you can't handle. Um, with to the equipment that that's on the way, yeah, at, and and the lease equipment that that's very good to know. Um, as far as we are concerned, if you go look at the at the discharge figures or the load or the crane moves per hour figures or the, even the truck waiting time, you can have as many plans in place as what you possibly want to, but until such a time as what those figures drastically improve, um, that's a time that we will get excited and we will be be a lot more happy about the situation um, uh, in the port of Cape Town. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So we have officially completed all of these presentations um, that were made um, or that were intended to be made orally. Uh, just to note, we have also received a submission from MSC as well, which the committee will consider. Um, I want to offer a final opportunity for anyone who would like to say something or add something, members or those who have joined us today. And the first hand I see is from Lynn. Thank you so much, Chair. From all the benchmarking work we've done so far, um, we can respond to the question from Aubrey about how long should it take for a vessel to wait before birthing? And so um, to pick up on what Eben said, I think Cape Town will be very grateful if we can be in that space where a vessel can birth on the day that it arrives. It looks to us as if that might be happening from next week. Um, so essentially within 24 hours of arrival is international good practice. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. The next hand I see is from Member van der Westhuizen. Yes, thank you, Chair. If you wouldn't mind me then taking the opportunity to say that's a very high note to end on. And uh, from my side, and I think I speak on behalf of many others, we want to say thank you very much for the presentations, but particularly for the hard work behind the, uh, the scenes. And uh, I think the more we engage with the Port of Cape Town, we, we, the more we realise the complexity. Uh, it's not an easy uh, uh, operation to manage. And um, let me just speak for myself. I want to say thank you very much, also in my capacity as chair of the Standing Committee on Agriculture, because those are the goods that are really time bound. And, uh, and thank you very much 
for what you've already achieved. Uh, we have unfortunately in the past often left these meetings with a lot of promises and, and uh, positive feelings, which unfortunately didn't always uh, materialize. And, and, uh, but I'm keeping good faith and uh, I really appreciate uh, particularly the willingness and the openness by those involved to share with us their challenges uh, and, and, and their plans. And uh, we can only, or I can only wish them well uh, for, for, for the implementation phase of all of that. Uh, as you've heard, we've got uh, high ambitions for our agricultural sector, particularly in the Western Cape. Hopefully the manufacturing sector will follow suit and, and that our exports will be able to improve uh, by 40% uh, in the in the not so dis, uh, distant future. So it's it's really important for us that we get to a level where there will even be a talk of redundancy of certain equipment and certain uh, infrastructure. So thank you very much uh, from my side and chair. Thank you very much also to you for for facilitating this session this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Van der Um, Basil, would you like to make the notes? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Honourable Members. Um, last week at uh, Minister Wenger's uh, stakeholders meeting, I made the following comment. I said, what is all the noise about? Every day you read and you see the noise, but what is the actual noise about? The question of, and everybody speaks about the equipment. Every article refers to equipment. You just heard the uh, Evan speak about the equipment and equipment, equipment. But currently, we have 27 to 29 RTGs. We have 44 haulers. We have our nine trains, barring breakdowns here and there. So we can't really blame the equipment, right? So again, I'm asking the question, what is the holdup? All right. So I'm going to refer to what Captain Jones mentioned earlier about the PwC report. All right. And in my opinion, the common there's two common themes in my opinion, and say again in my opinion, that speaks to a theme, and that is the people and management, amongst others. That also says there is a lack of oversight and accountability. So what am I actually saying here? I'm saying that we must look elsewhere. It's about looking at the people, the management, the processes, the recruitment, the training, the discipline. And lastly, Madam Chair, I think in all our engagements, we must have labor because KPIs and everything else is not about equipment, it's about people. And that is an, a crucial part of whatever we're discussing here. I know that there are engagements with labor every week, at the, but we, we as stakeholders, we don't see or hear what, what their challenges are within the framework of, of the industry. So I will leave it there, Chair. Thanks very much. Okay, with that, um, I see no further hands in the house and I see no further hands online. Um, so I would like to sincerely thank everyone who's joined us today, both online and in person. Um, you are excused and please help yourself to any of the refreshments that we've had. Um, I'm, I know I'm pushing this on you, but please have some. And um, members, just stay online so that we can deal with um, in-person, in-committee business, uh, particularly on taking resolutions. But once again, thank you to everyone. Um, thank you for making this possible. Our next step ultimately is to compile this in a report. Um, we want to take resolutions, which include solutions um, to the issues that have been identified today and to some of the proposals that have been made, and then send that off to the relevant minister. So thank you, everyone.
Perfect, members. Um, so we are just moving on to our business um, or committee business. Essentially, um, I'd just like to check in with you before we close off and see if you have any resolutions. Okay, hey, I see. Yes, Chair. Member uh, no, uh, no, Chair, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you, Member Brinkes. Member van der Beesthuizen. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've got a number of questions that I would like to propose uh, for okay. resolutions that we can forward to, to them due to the lack of time. No problem. Absolutely. Would you mind just emailing them through to Zahida? Indeed, I will. Uh, uh, so would you be happy if we can just email them and, and they can respond? Yep, no problem. OK, we'll do that then straight away. Thank you. OK, thank you. Members, any further resolutions? OK, I see none. From my side, I think what I would really like to ask from Transnet is if they would share their PwC research that they mentioned, um, which they'd shared with other stakeholders. I think it would be very helpful for us just to understand um, the outcomes of that research. And then for myself, I think, you know, we've spoken about haulers, we've spoken about RTGs, we've spoken about ship to shore cranes and, and all other manner of infrastructure. But what I'd like to see on paper, um, just for my own mind and my own ability to digest the information, is essentially what is the what is the specific piece of infrastructure that we need, for example, ship to shore crane. Um, what is the status of their procurement, um, whether you know it's gone out um, or it hasn't started yet? When is it anticipated to arrive and when will it be functional? And then also just some sort of explanation specifically on, on how this will help us achieve the eight point plan by having this hauler rented or by having this extra RTG. Um, members, if I could just get an indication of whether you support those resolutions. Support. Okay. All right. With that, we've had a very, very productive morning. And I'm sorry. sure everyone. Sorry, Chair. Can I yes, just add, add one more thing? Uh, sorry. Uh, I have seen through my questions, um, uh, which will, I trust, be added to yours. I just think that we need to express this morning our uh, gratitude for uh, all the efforts, but particularly also recognize the work of the Western Cape Department of Finance, Economic uh, Opportunities and Tourism in engaging with the Cape Town port and trying to alleviate the uh, bottlenecks that are uh, that have been experienced and, and for acting in the interest of the Western Cape and particularly our Western Cape uh, producers of agricultural products. I think, uh, and I speak under correction, but they are really going beyond what I believe any other provincial government uh, may be uh, doing in engaging, in offering support, and particularly like we've also seen this morning, I think there's great value in bringing the various role players uh, together. We, we were told this morning that, for example, the producers, those that are affected by the fact that their uh, exports are negatively impacted by any delays and so on, that they have for quite a, a significant uh, period in history not been you know, heard uh, as, as part of this conversation. And uh, and therefore, I think if we could just perhaps write to the minister and thank her and the department for the uh, uh, excellent work that they are doing in, uh, in 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 supporting the Western Cape economy by by supporting the the uh, con uh, conversations regarding the Cape Town port. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I agree. Um, I think that's a lovely resolution as well. All right, members. Um, I just, again, thank you for all the hard work today. Thank you for applying your minds. I hope that you found this interesting and also insightful. Um, I think, you know, it's important that we keep an eye out and continue to play our part in terms of ensuring that the port of Cape Town 
is efficient and continues to improve. Um, but on the other hand, members, none of this would be possible without your hard work. And I also think it would be remiss of me and us not to recognize the hard work of our procedural officer, Ms. Adams, who goes above and beyond, even when she is ill, um, to make sure that everything runs smoothly and that we have um, a very insightful array of visitors and guests. Um, and I think testament to that is that MSC's executive team themselves um, joined this call and um, provided a submission. So that really does speak to our hard work, but also and very much so to Ms. Adams' hard work. So thank you, Ms. Adams, on behalf of the committee. And thank you. Meeting adjourned. Have a wonderful rest of the day.